911, where's your emergency? I, I just woke up from my three year old's missing. Okay, what's your address, sir? All right, and what's your address? In uh, Hatton Township. What is it? Hatton Township. Hatton Township. Three year old boy or girl? Three year old boy. His name is Brendan. Okay, and you didn't hear anything or see anything or nothing like that? No, uh, I, I just woke up and he wasn't in my apartment. I don't know if he wandered out or what happened. I, I don't know where he is. The door was locked. I guess he unlocked it and left. All right, and your address is? Yes. Yes. Okay, you already had the police on the way, sir. What is your name? My name is DJ. In the early morning of October 13th, 2015, David Jr. Criado, a 21-year-old, placed a distressing call to 911 reporting the disappearance of his three-year-old son, Brendan, from their New Jersey home. Despite the distressing situation of his three-year-old son being missing, David Jr., also known as DJ, maintained a composed demeanor as he reported the incident. He patiently answered as police tried to get details to understand the circumstance of the disappearance of a three-year-old. He pointed out the possibility of Brendan opening the front door by himself and going out. His unusual demeanor raised questions about what could have led to the disappearance of such a young child. Did Brendan actually go outside by himself? Or could a darker and more sinister explanation lurk beneath the surface? Hi, and welcome to M7 Crime Storytime, where we shed light on solved, unsolved, and twisted cases across the world. This case takes us to New Jersey, a northeastern U.S. state with a vibrant atmosphere, cultural diversity, and easy access to major cities like New York and Philadelphia. Although New Jersey, like any state, faces crime challenges, its crime rates have been decreasing over time, thanks to investments in law enforcement and community programs. Yet the neighborhood of Haddon Township in Camden County of New Jersey was shocked and disheartened by the news of Brendan's disappearance and the subsequent revelation that came to light. The Haddon Township community in Camden County, New Jersey, was stunned by Brendan's disappearance and the unsettling revelations that followed. To unravel the truth and delve into the depths of this case, gaining a comprehensive understanding of the family dynamics within the Criado family is crucial. Brendan Criado was born on June 1, 2012, to Samantha and David Jr., commonly known as DJ. Samantha and DJ first crossed paths during their youth and developed a relationship in high school. Shortly after their high school graduation, Samantha discovered she was pregnant. They started their family and eventually moved into parenthood at the age of 18. However, the dynamics changed within their relationship soon. During the year 2014, Samantha found out that DJ had been unfaithful to her, leading to the end of their romantic relationship. Despite the breakup, Samantha and DJ maintained a good relationship for the sake of their child. They continued to co-parent Brendan and had shared custody. While Samantha primarily provided the day-to-day -day care for Brendan, DJ would spend alternate weekends with the child, ensuring regular father-son bonding time. During the time of Brendan's disappearance, he was spending the weekend with his father, DJ, at his apartment in Haddon Township, New Jersey. On October 13, 2015, DJ made a 911 call to report Brendan missing. In the call, he calmly informed the emergency dispatcher that he woke up in the morning and couldn't find Brendan in the apartment. DJ checked with neighbors, but received no information about Brendan's whereabouts. He suggested that Brendan could have unlocked the door to their upstairs apartment at night and gone outside. At approximately 6.07 a.m., the police arrived at DJ's apartment in response to the distressing situation. DJ appeared visibly distraught and genuinely upset as he welcomed the officers into his residence. During their initial interaction, DJ shared with the police that he'd last seen Brendan the previous night when he'd put him to bed. This information served as a critical starting point for the investigation as it provided a time frame for Brendan's disappearance and offered insight into the last known moments they spent together. DJ called his mother before calling 911 and then informed Samantha about Brendan's disappearance as they shared custody. Samantha reached the New Jersey residence to find her three-year-old son. Upon arrival, the police carefully assessed the surroundings, paying close attention to any potential signs or indications that could shed light on Brendan's disappearance. Nothing unusual was found in the residence, and there were no signs of a forced entrance. In order to aid in the research, the Child Abduction and Response Team, a field communication unit, and Delaware River Port with their K-9 unit were all called in. A red velvet Mickey Mouse slipper was delivered to the cadaver dog to sniff out Brendan's scent. 
After a thorough search for an hour, the canine unit of the Delaware River Port Authority's cadaver dog took Connie Nicholson, the canine handler, down a few streets and into some woods. As the minutes ticked by, the anxiety and anticipation grew. Finally, after an exhaustive search, a creek was located at the foot of a hill, and it was here where everyone's worst fear came true. Three-year-old Brendan's body was found with his face down, partially submerged in the water. The difficult task of informing Samantha and DJ about the news of their son's demise fell upon the police. While law enforcement officials are accustomed to handling tragic cases involving murders, homicides, and similar incidents, Brendan's case proved to be unforeseen and particularly sensitive. The nature of this case had a profound impact on the officers involved, especially those who were part of the search team. As the police delivered the news to DJ, his reaction was one of deep sorrow and disbelief. DJ leapt from his seat and let out a scream and expressed that Brendan was not just his son, but his closest companion, his best friend. Additionally, Brendan's mother, Samantha, was informed about Brendan's disappearance by DJ Creato through a call shortly after 6 a.m. Upon hearing the news, Samantha quickly rushed to DJ's apartment with her boyfriend, Matt Holshue, who lived nearby. Samantha arrived so promptly that law enforcement had not yet arrived for the subsequent community-wide search. She and her boyfriend conducted their search nearby. Eventually, a detective advised her to return home in case Brendan showed up there. Tragically, she learned of her son's death a few hours later, after DJ had been informed. Multiple autopsies conducted by different medical professionals, including Dr. Gerald Fagan and Dr. Charles Siebert, proved inconclusive in determining the cause of Brendan's death. A third autopsy, performed by Dr. Andrew Falzon, also failed to provide any definitive answers about the exact time and the cause of death. The inability to establish when or how Brendan died, or gather useful information about the perpetrator, added complexity and frustration to the investigation. Meanwhile, Dr. Fagan visited the location where Brendan's body was found, collecting water samples as part of the ongoing inquiry. The search for evidence and clues persisted as investigators aimed to unravel the mysteries surrounding Brendan's tragic demise. After eliminating assault and drugging as potential factors, the investigation into Brendan Creato's tragic death involved a series of thorough examinations. There were three rounds of autopsies performed, and the crime scenes were examined multiple times to uncover any evidence that could lead the direction of the investigation. Dr. Falzon's autopsies revealed only one insight, that Brendan likely endured oxygen deprivation for a minimum of 30 to 90 seconds before his death. Such a brief period without sufficient oxygen can have severe consequences on the vital functions of a three-year-old's body. Based on the autopsy findings and his expertise, the state medical examiner, Dr. Andrew Falzon, determined that Brendan's death resulted from homicidal violence. Notably, during the initial autopsy, a bite mark inside Brendan's mouth was overlooked by Dr. Fagan. This crucial detail was included in Dr. Falzon's report, though. However, due to the complexity of the case, the examiner was unable to pinpoint the precise cause or time of Brendan's death. While the reasons and details of Brendan's death remained elusive, the findings strongly suggested that he'd experienced an act of violence, indicating that his death was the result of a deliberate and intentional act by another person. Existing evidence in the case presented several perplexing aspects that created significant gaps in the investigation. These points raised crucial questions and avenues of inquiry for the investigators to explore further. The first deduction from the evidence was that someone had a deliberate and significant intention to harm and get rid of a defenseless three-year-old child like Brendan. This realization intensified the urgency to identify the responsible person and understand the motive behind such a crime. Secondly, the absence of forced entry into DJ's apartment became a puzzling detail. If the perpetrator was not a member of the family, it raised the question of how they gained access to the residence without leaving any signs of forced entry. Further, if the suspect was indeed someone from within the family, the investigation took a deeply personal turn. The investigators delved into the family dynamics and relationships, seeking to identify any potential individuals who could have been involved in committing such a horrendous crime against an innocent three-year-old child. Understanding why this happened needed details about the family's history and problems, reasons that might make someone in the family do something so sad. These gaps in the investigation highlighted the critical areas that demanded attention and exploration. Once DJ regained his composure, the police asked him to recount the events of the previous 24 hours. 
DJ stated that he'd followed his usual routine of reading three bedtime stories to Brendan. He also mentioned attempting to contact his 17-year-old girlfriend, Julia Stensky, who was studying in New York. DJ claimed he went to bed at 10 p.m., and the next morning when he woke up, Brendan was missing. During the 911 call, DJ suggested the possibility of Brendan wandering out of the apartment, while his family claimed that Brendan was afraid of the dark. However, the aforementioned claims were contradicted by the significant findings from the forensic investigation. Despite the muddy area where Brendan's body was discovered, his socks appeared remarkably clean, making it unlikely that he walked there on his own. Furthermore, a thorough examination of DJ's apartment revealed no signs of forced entry, weakening the possibility of an intruder or Brendan leaving on his own. Moreover, digital experts analyzing DJ's phone discovered that he was last active on Julia's Snapchat account at around 1.37 a.m. on October 13, 2015. This was in contrast to DJ's police statement, according to which he claimed to have gone to bed on October 12 at 10 p.m. and discovered Brendan missing at 6 a.m. Additionally, reports emerged that a few days before the murder, DJ had taken a photo of the spot where Brendan was later found. This spot held personal significance for DJ and was considered spiritual, with Julia testifying that she'd visited it multiple times with DJ in the past. These revelations further intensified suspicions surrounding DJ's involvement in Brendan's disappearance. The accumulating evidence challenged his account of events, indicating potential inconsistencies and raising questions about the circumstances leading to Brendan's tragic death. After a detailed investigation and collecting information, it was found that the nature of Julia and DJ's relationship went through significant changes since they began dating. Analysis of their communications revealed that they'd exchanged over 9,000 text messages within the past four months. Some of these texts uncovered Julia's expressions of disdain towards Brendan, indicating that she harbored negative feelings towards the young child. Investigators discovered that Julia had repeatedly given DJ an ultimatum, demanding that he choose between her and Brendan. The retrieved texts also hinted at DJ's own insecurities regarding a college acquaintance who had spent significant time with Julia. This fueled DJ's jealousy and paranoia. Moreover, Julia persistently pressured DJ to give up custody of Brendan or end their relationship. This created intense tension and conflict between them. Prior to Brendan's passing, on June 11, 2015, Julia and DJ had arguments about Brendan's presence while she was visiting on the weekend. The following day, on June 12, 2015, DJ dropped Julia off at a train station around 6.48 a.m. The police were able to eliminate Julia as a suspect. They obtained her swipe log from her college dorm at Pace University, confirming that she was in New York on October 13. However, despite her exclusion as a suspect, the hurtful remarks made by Julia about a three-year-old boy could not be excused. The investigation delved into the dynamics between Julia and DJ, uncovering a troubled relationship plagued by disagreements and ultimatums. While Julia's involvement in the crime was ruled out, the nature of the texts shed light on the strained dynamics within the relationship and provided additional context for understanding the events leading up to Brendan's death. The combination of circumstances and gathered evidence pointed towards DJ as the perpetrator of his son's death, leading to his arrest on January 11, 2016. DJ stood trial before the court for the murder charges of his own son, Brendan, in Camden Court. It was the first time that authorities presented a motive, as Assistant Prosecutor Christine Shaw put forth her contention. She argued that the 22-year-old DJ had taken the life of his son to maintain a relationship with his 17-year-old girlfriend. According to Shaw, DJ's actions were driven by paranoia and jealousy, which consumed him. During the trial, the prosecution presented the 9,000 text messages exchanged between DJ and his girlfriend over a span of four months before Brendan's death. This evidence aimed to emphasize the intensity and complexity of their relationship. These exchanges formed a critical part of the prosecution's case, pointing to DJ's state of mind and the potential influence it had on his actions. The presentation of this motive shed new light on the trial, unveiling a narrative centered around DJ's desire to salvage his relationship at any cost. The proceedings sought to provide clarity and bring justice for the tragic loss of Brendan's life, revealing the layers of emotions and circumstances that contributed to this case. In order to gain a comprehensive understanding of the entire trial, a detailed timeline of the trial was obtained. It provided details on the way the justice system handled information and evidence, along with witnesses that provided the base of the prosecution. On April 1, 2016, 
Defense attorney Richard Fushino Jr. filed a motion to dismiss the charges against DJ Creato, claiming that his client had not been read his rights during the investigator's interview. Prosecutors strongly countered this argument, deeming it absurd. However, on May 16, 2016, Superior Court Judge John Kelly rejected the defense's request to dismiss the murder indictment against Creato, stating that the motion lacked merit and the case proceeded to trial. June 14, 2016 marked a significant moment as video footage of Creato being informed about his son's death by detectives was played in the courtroom for the first time during an evidence hearing. The emotional display in the video showcased Creato's disbelief and heartbreak as he cried out, expressing his deep love for Brendan, calling him his best friend. Judge Kelly dismissed a defense argument claiming that Creato did not give authorities permission to search his cell phone and ruled out that evidence obtained from the phone can be admitted at the trial. On December 4, 2016, a bench was dedicated to Brendan Creato in Cooper River Park, close to the area where Brendan's body was discovered 14 months earlier. This memorial served as a reminder of Brendan's life and tragic loss. On January 9, 2017, Judge Kelly granted a trial delay until April after Creato's attorney requested more time to obtain an expert report. Finally, on April 19, 2017, DJ Creato's trial commenced with Judge Kelly instructing the jury. Over the course of the trial, Brendan's mother, Samantha, took the witness stand on April 20, 2017, testifying that DJ had suggested the presence of something supernatural as the reason behind Brendan's disappearance. In Camden Court, Officer Constance Nicholson from the Delaware River Port Authority revealed that it was her canine who led her to the body of Brendan Creato on April 25, 2017. The heartbreaking discovery took place in a creek located a little over a mile away from Brendan's father's residence. Officer Constance became visibly emotional as she recalled the hope she had held, praying that they'd find the young boy alive and safe. I had a jacket on because it was chilly that morning. Sorry. I thought that I would maybe wear it because uh, if we found the child, I could put it on because it was chilly. Testimony from DJ's ex-girlfriend, Julia Stensky, on May 2, 2017, revealed his jealousy, paranoia, and financial struggles during the time of Brendan's murder. I was 17 at the time. I just didn't think I was ready for the responsibility of caring for another woman's toddler. Digital forensic examiner Louis Sincano testified on May 16, 2017, about DJ snooping on Julia's social media accounts prior to reporting Brendan missing. The jury began deliberations on May 23, 2017, following closing statements from both sides. However, after more than a week of deliberations and signs of struggle, a mistrial was declared by Judge Kelly on May 31, 2017, due to a deadlock among the jurors. Subsequently, a new trial was set for September 11, 2017, during a status hearing on July 5, 2017. In a surprising turn of events, on August 23, 2017, the Camden County Prosecutor's Office announced that DJ had pleaded guilty to aggravated manslaughter in his son's death. Finally, on September 29, 2017, DJ was sentenced by Judge Kelly to 10 years in prison, with a parole date set for July 2024. The controversy surrounding the jury's decision to sentence DJ Creato to only 10 years is a deeply divisive issue that's left both sides of the case in turmoil. On one hand, DJ's family firmly believes in his innocence and feels that the sentence is unjust. They continue to support DJ, maintain his innocence, and advocate for a fairer outcome, believing that he should have been acquitted and released. On the other hand, Brendan's family, who have endured immeasurable pain and loss, strongly feels that justice has not been fully served. They believe that Brendan's death should have resulted in a harsher punishment for DJ, given the severity of the crime and the devastating impact it's had on their lives. Brendan's family continues to fight for the justice they believe Brendan deserved, seeking closure and a sense of accountability for the loss they've suffered. Samantha and her family refused to provide any comment throughout the case and even after the trial. However, just a year after Brendan's death, she did speak to one of the news channels about Brendan. She said, Even though no one really knew who he was, they still knew he was a great kid. In the course of the interview, Samantha aimed to discuss Brendan's life and highlight the positive energy he had. The differing perspectives and emotions surrounding the jury's decision have caused deep divisions and tensions within the community. It emphasizes the challenges of pursuing justice amid conflicting evidence and beliefs about guilt. 
the controversy over sentencing reflects ongoing struggles for resolution and closure. This serves as a reminder of the profound impact on lives and the complexity of the justice system. DJ's prioritization of his relationship with his girlfriend over the well-being of his own child contradicts his claims of Brendan being his best friend. The disturbing messages exchanged between DJ and Julie further highlight the disregard for Brendan's welfare. Brendan deserved a chance to live a full life, and his fate, discarded in a creek, is a devastating loss. The inadequate sentence and the circumstances surrounding Brendan's death have raised concerns about the fairness and integrity of the legal system. Do you think that the nature of the investigation played a significant role in the sentencing of DJ? Do you think it was justified? Washington 911, where's your emergency? Uh, Crown Federal Credit Union. We have a woman that's in here and she says that she's in the bank and she says that her husband is holding her captive. And okay. she possibly has a gun. She's in the parking lot. Okay, what kind of vehicle is he in? Did she tell you? Vehicle. Truck. Okay. A black truck. We tried so hard to get them apart. At night, he would tie a cord around her neck and then tie it to himself so that she couldn't escape when he slept. It wasn't him. It was two different people. It was like a bad penny. It just kept coming back. I went up to the DA's office and was talking to Kristen. And I come around there, and there was my daughter standing there. <laughs> It's so hard. Governor Tom Wolf signed Senate Bill 449, also known as Tierney's Law. This new law will protect victims of domestic violence by clarifying an existing law that allows judges to use risk assessment tools when setting bail in domestic violence cases. It will be called Tierney's, Tierney's Law. Oh, thank you. When Tierney Ewing fell in love with Kevin in eighth grade, she had no way of knowing what the future would hold. Their love was deep and all-encompassing. In 1986, at the mere age of 18, Tierney married her childhood sweetheart, Kevin. The couple went on to have two children, building a lovely family together in Washington County, Pennsylvania. But behind closed doors, all was not as it seemed. In 2001, the couple had a major fight and almost parted ways. However, on June 26, 2016, 48-year-old Tierney called in sick at work and suddenly cut contact with her family and friends. As the days passed with no sighting or news of Tierney, it seemed as if she had disappeared. Did Tierney have enough and simply run away? Or did something horrible happen to her? Today's story takes us to Washington County in the U.S. state of Pennsylvania. Washington County boasts a population of 209,000 as of the 2020 census. Established on March 28, 1781, it was named after George Washington, the renowned leader of the American Revolutionary War and the first president of the United States. The county boasts significant historical sites, such as the rock shelters at Meadowcroft Village, preserving some of the oldest pre-Clovis Native American dwellings in the country, as well as 21 well-preserved covered bridges. The county is also known for the historic Whiskey Rebellion that occurred during the 1790s. Washington County has a lower rate of violent and property crime than the national average, making it a safe place to reside. This community was Kevin and Cherney Ewing's home throughout their lives. They grew up and also raised their kids in West Findlay Township on the western edge of the county. Cherney Richelle Kopko Ewing was born on January 10, 1968 in Washington County, Pennsylvania to Richard and Annelle Kopko. She was raised in a close-knit and loving family with her two sisters, Tasha and Toya. Cherney's remarkable qualities were evident in the close bond she shared with her sisters. Growing up, the girls were inseparable and did everything together until Tierney entered 8th grade and met Kevin Ewing. Tierney's life took a decisive turn when she began a relationship with Kevin during 8th grade. 
The change she underwent became apparent to all, particularly her sisters. Kevin Ewing, a year her junior, was a fellow resident of the county and shared the same school. As Tierney's connection with Kevin deepened, her once active social life began to wane. His influence prompted her to gradually distance herself from friends and, remarkably, even her own family, marking an early sign of distress for Tierney's sister, Tasha. It was agonizing for her loved ones to witness Tierney's liveliness dimmed by the encroaching dominance of Kevin. Anil Kopko, Tierney's mother, grappled with mounting concern about the repercussions of this relationship. Despite her best efforts to sever the ties, Tierney remained resolute. We tried so hard to get them apart. It was like a bad penny. It just kept coming back. In 1986, at the tender age of 18, Tierney made the life-altering decision to marry Kevin. They welcomed two children, a daughter named Morgan and a son named Derek. Beneath the facade of family life, however, lurked a sinister side to Kevin. However, a dark and troubling reality was unfolding behind closed doors. Kevin concealed a sinister and violent side, tainted by a disturbing criminal history. He became an abusive spouse, with Tierney bearing the brunt of his anger and aggression. What seemed like a harmonious partnership to the world was, in fact, a cycle of torment and suffering for Tierney. In 2001, a violent incident at the hands of Kevin compelled Tierney to seek legal protection through a court-issued protection from abuse order. The severity of the situation was evident in her injuries, which required hospitalization. She had been hospitalized or required medical treatment from those injuries. He had also beaten her. Um, he had slammed her about the room. She had bruises on her shoulders, her back, her legs. He had duct taped her mouth shut and with zip ties and duct tape tied her in a closet for an extended period of time. At night, he would tie a cord around her neck and then tie it to himself so that she couldn't escape when he slept. Despite the court order and the very tangible danger she faced, Kevin's threats to harm her family left Tierney with fear. The safety of her children and aging parents bound her to him, and in a wrenching decision, she returned to him. Tierney's resilience was remarkable as she endured the agonizing confines of a tumultuous marriage, all the while meticulously shielding her family from the horrors she faced. Then, in June 2016, a new chapter began as Cherney and Kevin separated, signaling a glimmer of hope for her to regain control over her life's direction. From June 26 to July 8, 2016, over the course of 12 consecutive days, Cherney disconnected from her usual routines, calling in sick to work and isolating herself from her family. Her continued absence from work and minimal communication with her family and friends sent alarm bells ringing. Where did Cherney Ewing go? For 12 days, Tierney Ewing suffered in captivity, enduring unimaginable torment inflicted by her husband, Kevin Ewing. Her life became a living nightmare, isolated from the comfort and support she desperately needed. Each night, Kevin would mercilessly bind a tight cord around her neck, holding her hostage like an animal while he slept. The mere thought of escape was impossible for Tierney. But that was not the extent of Kevin's cruelty. He'd often press a gun against her temple, threatening to kill her and reminding her of how fragile she was. Kevin was very controlling of her. He was controlling of her phone calls, of who she saw, where she went, what she did. And that was the norm for them from the time that she was very young. His threats echoed in her ears, promising to snuff out her life and those she held dear. Kevin reveled in his ability to manipulate her, deriving sadistic pleasure from the fear that danced in her eyes as he threatened to harm her aging parents. Tierney was her husband's prisoner, controlled by the whims of a man consumed by darkness and rage. He dictated her every move and controlled every aspect of her life. For Tierney, freedom became a distant memory, even as the world around her continued on, oblivious to the horrors she faced. Throughout the agonizing 12-day ordeal, Kevin's evil grip on Tierney's freedom tightened like a vice. Even her most private moments were stripped away of dignity, as he hovered over her like a relentless shadow. He even followed her to the bathroom. He went everywhere with her, to the bathroom, everywhere. 
there was no respite for tyranny and no mercy from her ruthless captor. Kevin's sadistic tactics knew no bounds. Knowing that Tierney was afraid of water and couldn't swim, he forcibly took her to a lonely location near a large body of water, threatening to drown her. He gained a cruel pleasure in exploiting her deepest fears. He took her to a very desolate area, to a location near water. She was terrified of water. She couldn't swim. When Tierney dared to make an attempt to leave, Kevin's rage exploded. He used a searing hot rod to callously burn her legs, leaving scars that would forever bear witness to her suffering. During that time, he had a metal rod that he put in a fire that they cooked hot dogs on, and he had burned her legs several places up and down her legs. Kevin also stomped on her foot, making it impossible for her to run. From then on, Tierney was forced to wear flip-flops, a constant reminder that she was powerless to escape her prison of physical and emotional abuse. Finally, after enduring 11 horrible days of captivity, a glimmer of hope opened up for Tierney. On that fateful 12th day, an unexpected chance for escape presented itself, and Tierney grabbed at it with both hands. However, this opportunity could potentially cost her life. On July 8, 2016, Kevin made a critical mistake. At gunpoint, he forcefully directed Tierney to a nearby credit union to handle their mortgage payment. However, in an unexpected twist, Kevin allowed Tierney to enter the credit union alone, granting her a rare moment of independence. Tierney bravely seized the chance to confide in the staff, urgently sharing her story of captivity and imploring them to help. Washington 911, where's your emergency? Uh, Crown Federal Credit Union. We have a woman that's in here and she says that she's in the bank and she says that her husband is holding her captive. Okay. He possibly has a gun. She's in the parking lot. Okay. What kind of vehicle is he in? Did she tell you? Vehicle. Truck. Okay. A black truck. The employees reacted swiftly, ushering Tierney into a secure room and immediately alerting the authorities. With remarkable speed, law enforcement officers arrived at the scene and arrested Kevin. But Tierney's fear persisted, deeply rooted in the terrifying experiences she'd endured. She was very panicked. Um, she wanted to be locked up. Even once the police got there and had apprehended him and arrested him, she was too afraid to go out the front door. She wanted to evade any potential encounter with Kevin and insisted on being escorted discreetly through the back door of the credit union to avoid Kevin's line of sight. She insisted that the police take her out the back door where he couldn't see her. The extent of Tierney's suffering became evident when she was taken to a local hospital. The horrific physical injuries she bore told a shocking tale of abuse and captivity. Her head bore aggressive marks of pistol whipping, her knees had suffered the merciless blows of a hammer, and her legs carried the searing burn marks of branding. Duct tape and zip ties had been used to keep her locked in a closet. Her neck bore marks of the cord that kept her leashed at nights, stripping away her very humanity. Cherney's suffering ran deeper than wounds, as Kevin had threatened, humiliated, and degraded her, often spitting on her face. Heartbreakingly, Cherney's parents were oblivious to her kidnapping until they stumbled upon the distressing news in a local newspaper. It was unbelievable what we learned from the paper. It was front page for I can't tell you how long. Their anguish intensified when they rushed to the hospital, and were confronted with the painful reality of their daughter's injuries firsthand. I went up to the DA's office and was talking to Kristen, and I come around there, and there was my daughter standing there. <laughs> it's so hard. Even though Kevin had been arrested, Cherney's road to recovery was long and challenging. Rebuilding her life wasn't easy, as the scars both physical and emotional, served as a reminder of the horrors she endured. With unwavering support from her loved ones and the legal team, she sought to reclaim her life. Her family hoped that with Kevin's arrest, Tierney's prolonged nightmare might finally come to an end. Unfortunately, their hopes would soon be dashed. While Tierney focused on healing, the police looked into the kidnapping case. They searched the Ewing's home in West Findlay Township, and discovered unsettling evidence of Tierney's torture and captivity. Used zip ties, duct tape, and blood. 
Despite a court order in 2016 that explicitly forbade Kevin from possessing any weapons, he was armed to the teeth and loaded with guns and a knife. He'd been armed even when taking Cherney to the credit facility. Which raised the question, how did no one notice what was happening? The couple's adult son, Derek, was living in the house, and Kevin and Cherney would frequently leave together. Yet no one suspected that Cherney was being held hostage in her own home. In addition, Cherney's own efforts to conceal her suffering played a significant role in hiding her ordeal from her grown-up children. She deliberately concealed her bruises under long sleeves, choosing not to draw attention to her wounds, making it harder for anyone to notice the signs of abuse. Kevin Ewing was charged with multiple offenses, including kidnapping, aggravated assault, terroristic threats, carrying a firearm without a license, and unlawful restraint. He'd also violated the terms of the protection from abuse order. His bond was set at $100,000. Despite the severity of the allegations against him, and to the dismay of many, the judge allowed Kevin to post bail and walk freely until the trial. Fearing for her life, Cherney sought solace and support from Assistant District Attorney Kristen Klingerman, who urgently pleaded for Kevin's return to custody. With the case back in court, the weight of justice rested on the shoulders of Judge Gary Gilman. Prosecutor Klingerman meticulously presented the charges against Kevin, highlighting the gravity of his heinous crimes, kidnapping and assault. To strengthen her case, she included photographic evidence that bore witness to the extent of Cherney's injuries, emphasizing Kevin's possession of firearms despite his prior conviction for domestic violence. Under Pennsylvania law, he was strictly forbidden from possessing such weapons. Klingerman pointed out the history of domestic violence in Kevin's past and appealed for a higher bond to ensure that Kevin would not be able to evade justice or pose further threat to Tierney's safety. But the argument did not move Judge Gilman, who maintained that Kevin should be free on bail. The only change he made was to issue an order for Kevin to wear an ankle bracelet monitor and to strictly avoid any contact with Tierney. Even then, the judge didn't agree to an ankle monitor that would be able to transmit Kevin's precise location at all times. Instead, he instructed that the ankle monitor be able to give a signal if Kevin ever left the house. This was despite the fact that Tierney had been confined and tortured mostly in the house. Prosecutor Klingerman and Tierney's parents were unhappy with the decision, but they had no choice but to comply. They could only hope that these precautions would protect the battered wife from her tormentor. In the initial weeks after his release, Kevin appeared to comply with the conditions of his bond, intentionally playing the role of a reformed man. But it was all a calculated strategy to lure Tierney back into his clutches again. Tragically, his plan unfolded with devastating precision. Despite the court order prohibiting contact and the ankle bracelet monitoring his location, the toxic relationship between Kevin and Tierney persisted. Against all odds, Cherney found herself back in the house with Kevin and his mother, Rosalie. The complexities of domestic violence and the psychological dynamics at play made it difficult for Cherney to sever ties completely. Her sister, recognizing the immense bravery in Cherney's actions, believed it was an act of selflessness, another desperate attempt to shield her loved ones from Kevin's wrath. But this would come at a heavy cost to Cherney. I think... The top priority was to keep everyone safe. And she didn't want anybody else to drug into this with her. On the midnight of August 30th, 2016, Kevin Ewing initiated the final chapter of his ill-fated romance. Kevin's mother, Rosalie, made a distressing call to the Pennsylvania State Police, informing them that Kevin had taken Tierney hostage in the basement of their home at gunpoint. By the time police arrived, Kevin had forcefully removed Tierney from the house and driven away with her in their vehicle to an unknown location. He'd cut off his ankle monitor, which, surprisingly, had failed to notify the authorities the way it was supposed to. The gravity of the situation was starkly apparent to the police. Less than two months after her 12-day ordeal of captivity, Tierney Ewing had been abducted yet again by her husband. When Assistant DA Kristen Klingerman received the distressing news at 5.30 a.m., she knew deep down that a tragic ending was inevitable. I received the call at about 5.30 a.m. that he had taken her, and that's when I knew there wasn't going to be a happy ending. Despite exhaustive efforts by law enforcement to locate the pair all morning, the search efforts proved fruitless. We had worked the case all day and hadn't had any luck in locating them. 
In the afternoon, a vigilant local farmer made a startling discovery in a remote field in rural Washington County. He noticed a peculiar sight, a pair of blue jeans protruding from a barn window. The farmer quickly alerted the police, who swiftly responded to the scene. Their arrival was met with screams and gunshots, shattering the calm of the countryside. Pennsylvania State Trooper Sarah T. Garden recounted the chilling sequence of events. The police officers, upon reaching the scene, were met with the haunting echoes of multiple gunshots and anguished cries. The first gunshot rang out, followed by the distressed plea of a female voice, Why'd you have to shoot me? A man's voice responded with a callous command, Get out of here, followed by a second ominous shot. At last, a third and final gunshot reverberated through the air. They heard the initial shot. They heard a female voice say, why'd you have to shoot me? And they heard the second shot. They heard a man's voice yell, get out of here. And then they heard the third shot. The officers quickly entered the weathered barn and ascended to the loft where Tierney was held captive. As they entered, their worst fears were realized. The first shot had caused a serious injury, hitting Tierney's forehead. The first shot that they heard, he had shot her in the forehead and a 22 caliber, it's not a very um, powerful gun, um, and that bullet actually didn't penetrate her skull. It just kind of traveled between her skull and her skin to the back of her head. Surprisingly, even though the bullet was a 22 caliber and relatively weak, it hadn't been fatal. This had led Tierney to question the reason behind the shooting. Unfortunately, Tierney's attacker had responded with a second shot, penetrating her skull and resulting in Tierney's passing. In a shocking twist, Kevin Ewing had saved the third and last bullet for himself in an attempt to escape the consequences of his heinous actions. Amid the horrors of that barn, authorities were shocked to find him still clinging to life, although gravely wounded. Responding officers immediately tried to stabilize him. State Trooper Sarah Teagarden recounted their efforts. They performed some life-saving measures on him. They were able to get him into a helicopter and transferred to a Pittsburgh hospital where he remained alive for a couple of days. Eventually, Kevin Ewing succumbed to the self-inflicted gunshot wound. His demise marked the final chapter of this tragic tale of domestic abuse and violence. The devastating loss of 48-year-old Cherney Ewing sent shockwaves through her family and the local community. Her father, Richard Kopko, overwhelmed with unfathomable anguish and anger, blamed the justice system for his daughter's tragic death. He expressed his frustration in an interview. What can I say? My daughter's dead, and he's sick, and the judges let him go. Oh, big deal. They put a bracelet on him, and she's six miles away. Come on, give me a break. There's something wrong with the judging system in this country. In a heart-wrenching cry for justice, he boldly asserted, the judge killed my daughter. The judge killed my daughter. The accusations were firmly aimed at Judge Gary Gilman, the presiding judge in Tierney's case who had allowed Kevin to post bail. However, amid the outpouring of grief, Tierney's tragic story stirred a path-breaking change. Pennsylvania State Senator Camara Bartolotta, who was profoundly moved by the harrowing account of domestic violence, felt an unshakable resolve to prevent similar tragedies from unfolding in the future. Senator Bartolotta took bold actions by introducing a critical piece of legislation specifically addressing the issue of domestic violence. Named Tierney's Law in honor of the courageous woman whose life was cut tragically short, this proposed legislation seeks to empower judges with additional tools to assess the level of risk and make more informed decisions. One of the key provisions of Tierney's Law grants judges the authority to deny bail in cases where there's a significant potential for danger to the victim. The intent behind the law is to prevent perpetrators of domestic violence from being released and further endangering their victims. For Tierney's grieving family, Tierney's Law represents a glimmer of hope amid the darkness of their loss. It offers the possibility that future victims of domestic violence may experience a different fate Governor Tom Wolf signed Senate Bill 449, also known as Tierney's Law. This new law will protect victims of domestic violence by clarifying an existing law that allows judges to use risk assessment tools when setting bail in domestic violence cases. It will be called Tierney's, Tierney's Law. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. 
at least we helped her in some way. Shielded by the proactive measures taken by the judiciary, Tierney Ewing's legacy helps ensure that no one continues to suffer the devastating consequences of intimate partner violence. The call for justice resonates far beyond Tierney's personal tragedy, urging us all to join hands in creating a world where domestic violence has no place and where victims can find refuge and support in their time of need. Tierney possessed a resilient spirit, marked by her determination to confront challenges head-on. She firmly believed that she could handle the situation herself and was desperate to shield her loved ones from suffering and pain. State Trooper Sarah Teagarden affirmed Tierney's indomitable spirit, stating, Tierney was a tough girl. She was not going to go out there and, and look for help. She, she felt like she could handle it and that she could make it right and keep her family together. Tierney's father, Richard, also believed that Kevin's attorneys had alerted him to the severity of the charges he faced for his 12-day assault on Tierney. Richard speculated that Kevin didn't want to return to jail, which contributed to the last final episode of the murder-suicide. Tierney's adult daughter, Morgan Miller, also shared her story. In an emotional interview, she expressed her anger at the actions of her father, believing that Kevin Ewing had been dealing with severe mental health issues. I genuinely believe that my father was sick, that no person in their right mind would do these things. There are avenues to get out, and it's terrifying, and it's probably the scariest thing you'll ever do in your life. However, the hardest part for Morgan was knowing that her mother had sacrificed herself to keep the family safe. My mom was the best mom. She would do anything for anyone. She was an amazing woman that's leaving a legacy behind. Assistant DA Kristen Klingerman also agreed that Tierney's primary objective was to keep her loved ones safe, sparing them from the darkness that consumed her own life. As the memory of Tierney lives on, her story serves as a poignant reminder of the urgent need to address the pervasive issue of domestic violence. The pain and suffering endured by Cherney should not be in vain. It should serve as a catalyst for change, prompting society to take a stand against all forms of abuse and advocate for the safety and well-being of every individual. What do you think should have been done to avoid this tragedy? Do you agree with Cherney's father that the judge contributed to her death? What happened on August 22nd, 1983 completely stopped the entire community of Colorado. Lori Poland became a household name, her family's trauma on national TV. Don't you think that you should have called the police to make sure that was true before you should have put that on the air? On the sweet summer morning of August 22nd, 1983, three-year-old Lori Poland was playing in the yard outside her home and laughing without a care in the world. Tired from the heat, she requested a popsicle from her father, who was keeping a watchful eye on her. But when her father came out of the house with a popsicle, Lori had vanished. What happened to Lori? Did she simply walk off, or was there a darker and more evil explanation behind her disappearance? Sheridan is a self-governing municipality situated in Arapahoe County, Colorado, United States. As of 2020, it had a population of 6,000 people. Because of the small population, the town is extremely close-knit. Originally part of the Indian Territory, Sheridan has a rich history. The town's origins can be traced back to John McBroom, the first white settler who arrived in the area in 1859 and homesteaded 160 acres. Sheridan owns its name to Army General Philip H. Sheridan, who established Fort Lodge in the vicinity, contributing to the town's growth. Although the military post eventually closed down, Sheridan continues to thrive and exert influence through redevelopment projects. Sheridan is a welcoming and friendly community, and this is where Lori Poland's family lived. Lori Poland was born to Richard and Diane Poland in Sheridan, Colorado, on July 24, 1980. She grew up alongside her brother, who was two years older than her. With mischievous blue eyes and long blonde hair, Lori was adored by everyone in the community. I was this, like, darling little blonde three-year-old like i mean i have videos of me and i just like want to squeeze me because i was so <laughs> cute i love i love little kids and i was one of them man i just like i had a fire in me 
Richard and Diane Poland's home in Sheridan was filled with the joy and laughter of their two young children. The couple were vigilant and caring parents, ensuring that their children always felt safe, happy, and supported. Lori was full of life and curiosity. She loved exploring the world and caring for others from a young age. Like many children, she enjoyed the simple pleasures of playing outdoors, attempting to catch butterflies, and experiencing the wonder of nature. Her parents lovingly nurtured her curiosity and encouraged her to pursue her interests. Lori and her older brother would often play outside in the yard in the summer heat, their laughter filling the air. It was during one of these carefree moments that tragedy struck. On August 22, 1983, while Richard was watching the children play outside, their innocent request for popsicles to cool down in the summer heat prompted him to step inside the house momentarily. When Richard returned, he was confronted with an unimaginable scene. Lori had vanished, leaving only her pants on the curb. When Richard discovered that Lori was nowhere to be found, he became instantly confused and nearly had a panic attack. But he had the presence of mind to contact the police and report the abduction of his precious daughter. By this time, Lori's mother, Diane, was overwhelmed with terror. The couple searched around the street for Lori. Hoping for the best, they thought that she'd perhaps veered down the street and went to a neighbor's house. But that didn't explain why her pants were discarded on the curb. During the search, a neighbor named Paul Weaver emerged as a critical witness. Paul had been observing his children playing outside from his kitchen window when he witnessed the abduction unfold before his very eyes. Paul had seen an orange Datsun sedan pull over, and to his horror, a little girl, clad only in a red t-shirt, was taken into the vehicle before it sped away. Paul's quick thinking provided a critical piece of information. The first half of the abductor's license plate number, which began with the letters ADV. Paul's brave act of providing the partial license plate number became the first real lead for investigators. I saw an orange Datsun sedan with black letters and strips at the bottom. It was double parked in front of my house and about two minutes later, I came out of my house and the children were coming down the street saying that Lori was in that car. As it left off, I noticed the first part of the license plate number was ADV, followed by three numbers. In the midst of the search for Lori, another neighbor, Michael Fisher, came forward with more vital information. Michael had heard about Lori's abduction on the news and recalled an unsettling encounter his own children had experienced just days before. They'd reported being followed by a strange man who offered them candy, coaxing them to remove their pants and enter his vehicle. Michael recalled that after his children told him about the strange man, he hurried outside with a racing heart, determined to confront the intruder attempting to lure his kids away. But he was a bit late. The perpetrator, who was around 5 foot 8 inches with shaggy brown hair, quickly made his escape, jumping into an orange Datsun sedan and speeding away. He came up a week before and said a man had followed them home from school and was trying to give them candy if they agreed to take their pants off. So I drove over to their school and I saw a man with shoulder length hair and a beard. I got out of the car and said, hey you, and he took off running towards Bear Creek. I tried to follow him, but lost him after a while. He was about 5'8", 155 pounds, and his hair was dirty, like dishwater brown. The eerie similarity between this incident and Lori's abduction raised alarms and intensified the urgency of the investigation. In the absence of social media and Amber Alerts, Lori's abduction in broad daylight sent shockwaves through the community. As fear and uncertainty swept over Sheridan, the community rallied together, driven by compassion and a shared determination to bring Lori home safely. Flyers were plastered throughout the town, with Lori's innocent face capturing the attention of all who passed by. The story soon gained media attention. A helicopter was deployed for an aerial search, and Richard and Diane appeared on the news, tearfully pleading for the safe return of their beloved daughter. Just bring her back. The emotional toll on the family was immeasurable. The profound trauma experienced by her parents, grappling with the unimaginable loss of a child, also had a lasting impact on her five-year-old brother's mind. The entire community shared the pain and anguish felt by Richard and Diane, each person yearning for Lori's safe return. The collective efforts of the community and law enforcement were fueled by hope and the unwavering belief that Lori would be found. Following the information provided by Michael Fisher and Paul Weaver, the police set to work. On the first day, the case met with little progress, which left people questioning how such a heinous crime could occur in broad daylight and go unresolved. The police requested that anyone with information on Lori's whereabouts should contact them immediately. 
It was on the second day of Lori's disappearance that a woman named Juanita Zappa made a crucial call to the police. Juanita vividly recalled an unsettling encounter her granddaughter had with a man driving an orange Datsun a few weeks prior. Thankfully, her son-in-law had the presence of mind to jot down the license plate number, ADV 627. This vital clue led authorities to the registered owner of the vehicle, a 22-year-old man named Robert Paul Theret. Robert resided in Denver, Colorado with his mother. Recognizing the importance of their findings, law enforcement swiftly made their way to Robert's home, where they spotted the orange Datsun parked in the driveway. Robert denied having any involvement in Lori's abduction. However, investigators were convinced that they'd found their prime suspect. A thorough search of Robert's residence ensued, fueled by the hope of finding Lori safe and sound. However, as they meticulously combed through the premises, a sense of disappointment and desperation settled over the authorities. Lori was not found, and the search for her intensified as the clock continued to tick. Fortunately, on the third day, Lori was miraculously discovered, thanks to a couple who were hiking and birdwatching in the beauty of nature in the foothills west of Denver. Cynthia Gollin recounted hearing strange crying sounds amid the tranquility of the hills. Instinctively, they followed the cries, their hearts pounding with concern and uncertainty. As they approached the source of the desperate pleas, they discovered that the crying sounds were coming from a toilet pit. This prompted her husband, Stephen Gollin, to shine his flashlight into the hole only to discover an innocent but terrified three-year-old girl trapped in a toilet pit, a victim of unspeakable cruelty. She was, she was in the bottom of the privy hole. When they asked the girl how she'd ended up there, she only replied, I live here. And so eventually they looked down and they said, what are you doing here? And I told them that I lived there. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was my new normal. Like I just, I literally thought I lived in the bottom of a toilet. Following further conversations, they discovered that the child was the missing Lori Poland. After being assaulted, she'd been callously thrown into a dark and desolate 15-foot deep sewage pit. Her young life teetered on the precipice of despair. But Lori Poland's spirit would not be extinguished. Despite the unimaginable horrors she faced, she clung to a persistent will to survive. For three agonizing days, she fought against the darkness, fear, and pain. Her resilience paid off when those vigilant bird watchers heard her faint cries echoing from the depths of the forsaken outhouse. Their timely arrival marked a turning point in Lori's harrowing journey. With compassion and determination, the bird watchers embarked on a daring rescue mission. They set up ropes and instruments to help them descend into the depths to save the fragile life that had been left to suffer alone. The arrival of an off-duty firefighter, Stephen Baker, added another layer of heroism to the unfolding drama. With immense care and determination, he rescued Lori from the grim depths of the pit, only to find that her legs were blackened and infected. Their heroic efforts brought Lori back into the embrace of her family, reuniting them in a flood of relief and overwhelming joy. Once safe, Lori was immediately taken to the hospital, where she crossed paths with pediatrician Dick Krugman. Dr. Krugman's expert care and compassion played a pivotal role in Lori's recovery establishing a bond that endured long after her physical wounds had healed. Their connection deepened, evolving into a lifelong friendship. This would eventually inspire Lori to become a therapist herself, determined to help others overcome their adversity. Lori's agonizing confinement in the pit took a toll on her legs, which were completely black and infected when she was rescued. Medical professionals expressed concerns about the circulation in her feet, which had become swollen from standing in the liquid that filled the pit. They were concerned that her legs might need amputation or that she would never walk again. But Lori fought against the odds and made a remarkable recovery. Lori's harrowing experience was shared by one doctor who revealed that she'd mentioned seeing both day and night while looking up from the pit. Although Lori could not accurately determine the duration of her captivity, she had described being there for a long, long time. The doctors provided essential care and attention to her physical and emotional well-being as she began her recovery process. Meanwhile, the authorities continued their investigation into the abduction. With no suspects in custody, police focused their efforts on collecting evidence, including making casts of the tire tracks surrounding the outhouse. They hoped these leads would provide crucial information to aid in the search for the perpetrator. Members of the rescue team, such as Joanne Greenberg, confirmed that there had been no feasible way for Lori to free herself from the pit. It was evident that whomever had placed her there did not intend for her to escape. As Lori received medical care, her mother, Diane Poland, remained by her side. 
During her hospital stay, Diane witnessed her daughter experiencing a nightmare and screaming in distress. Medical professionals and a child psychologist provided support and assistance to Lori and her parents, helping them navigate the emotional aftermath of the traumatic event. In a heartwarming show of support, numerous gestures of kindness were extended to Lori and her family. 21 large stuffed animals were delivered to the hospital, offering comfort and solace during her recovery. Additionally, Frontier Airlines and First Financial Securities Corp announced a generous all-expenses-paid trip to Disneyland for Lori, her parents, and her five-year-old brother as soon as she was released from the hospital. The road to healing was a challenging one for Lori and her family, but the overwhelming support from both the medical community and compassionate individuals provided a sense of hope and restoration. The outpouring of generosity demonstrated the resilience and unity of the community, showcasing the human capacity for compassion and a collective desire to help those in need. Despite Lori being found and recovering well, the police didn't give up. It was crucial to ensure that what happened to Lori would not happen to any other child, and so the investigation intensified. The police waited for Lori to recover a bit before asking her questions. A photograph of the major suspect, Robert Paul Theret, was shown to Lori for identification, and it immediately set off a reaction within the little girl. That's him, that's him, she exclaimed, overcome with terror. Lori was visibly distressed and trembling with fear as she identified Robert as her abductor. She was rock solid in her identification. Her body language said, Mommy, that's him, and she sort of reeled back. She was a little scared. She revealed that Robert had offered her candy in exchange for dropping her pants on the curb, and when she came close to collect the candy, he'd whisked her away. With the other testimonies from the witnesses, Robert was declared wanted by the police. On September 7, 1983, Robert surrendered to the police and was held on a $250,000 bond. He was subsequently charged with multiple offenses, including attempted murder, assault, and kidnapping. The impending trial brought a mix of hope and fear, with prosecutors navigating the delicate balance of justice and uncertainty. The prosecutors believed that there was no major evidence to tie him to the crime, which served as a hindrance to the case. In an unexpected turn of events, just before the trial, Robert married his girlfriend, who provided an alibi for him on the day of the abduction. Faced with the challenge of limited evidence, prosecutors made a difficult decision. They offered Robert a plea deal, reducing the charges to assault while dropping the others. The outcome left many questioning whether justice had truly been served. Meanwhile, police sought retribution for the horrific crimes committed against Lori. While Lori focused on rebuilding her life and pursuing her passion, the man responsible for her abduction, 22-year-old Robert Paul Theret, was brought to trial. During the proceedings, details emerged about Robert's troubled childhood, marked by chaos and trauma. It was revealed that he himself had been a victim of assault at the age of three. While that did shed light on the complexities of his own upbringing and the potential influence it may have had on his behavior, it didn't excuse his horrific actions. In September 1984, Robert was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for the heinous crimes he committed against Lori. During a special hearing in front of Littleton District Court Judge Charles Friedman, Robert pleaded guilty to charges of assault and attempted first-degree murder. The severity of the crimes and the public outcry demanded a punishment commensurate with the suffering inflicted upon Lori. However, Robert's sentence was not without controversy. Incarcerated for six years, Robert's release on December 7, 1990, raised concerns and ignited a public debate. Robert's release came after he'd served a major part of the 10-year prison sentence imposed upon him. Despite the severity of his crimes, he benefited from early release due to his demonstrated good behavior while in prison. Robert was eligible for release in 1989, but it was delayed due to public pressure and he remained behind bars for an additional year. The Colorado Supreme Court later ruled that, due to the delay, Robert had to be released rather than paroled in accordance with the law at the time of the incident. Although his time served fell within the parameters of his sentence, the public's dissatisfaction with the outcome was clear. Calls for a lengthier incarceration echoed through the state, with widespread sentiment that Robert should have faced a more substantial punishment for his abhorrent actions against Laurie. Since his release, the public has been keenly interested in Robert's whereabouts and whether he's shown any signs of reform. Over 60 years old now, Robert lives in San Pedro, California, where he's registered as a high-risk sex offender. The repercussions of his crimes against Lori Poland continue to provoke discussions about the justice system, the importance of safeguarding society, and the ongoing challenge of preventing and addressing such acts of violence.
Lori Poland's story is one of resilience, transformation, and unwavering dedication to making a positive impact on the lives of others. After surviving the horrifying ordeal, Lori's channeled her pain into a mission of helping those who have endured similar traumas. Despite her initial desire to speak to Robert and offer forgiveness during her youth, Lori now harbors no intention of ever encountering him again. Her focus lies in making a positive impact on the world. Do you feel like justice was served? For me, it's not really about justice. It's more about being impactful. And every day I wake up and I just try and be impactful and try and be good in the world and prevent people from growing up and causing harm. Today, Lori's 43 years old. She's a licensed therapist, offering her expertise and compassion to those seeking healing and support. Lori has passionately dedicated herself to the field for many years, acquiring various licenses and certifications along the way. She embarked on her career soon after completing her education, joining the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless in 2007. Lori held positions such as Program Manager at Denver Counseling, working tirelessly for over four years until 2011. She then transitioned to the Kemp Center in 2008, where she worked in programs related to infant mental health and the well-being of children under six years old. Continuing her journey, Lori served as a family preservation therapist at Griffith Centers for Children from July 2011 to April 2012, specializing in Denver counseling options. Presently, she continues to make a meaningful impact as a mental health therapist at Denver Counseling Options, where she's dedicated over 12 years of her professional life. Throughout her career, Lori Poland has acquired numerous licenses and certifications, including sand tray therapy, attachment and relationship bonding, specialization in adolescent therapy, marriage and family therapy certificate, child and adolescent certificate, and many others. These achievements highlight her commitment to expanding her knowledge and honing her skills to provide the best possible care to her clients. Her work as a therapist is a testament to her strength and the transformative power of turning personal adversity into a force for good. Her diverse skill set and extensive experience allows her to make a significant impact on the lives of those she serves. Lori's impact also extends beyond her therapeutic practice. Lori has embraced her passion for writing and is an accomplished author and advocate, using her voice to raise awareness and inspire change. Her memoir, I Live Here, offers a gripping account of her traumatic childhood experiences, the process of healing, and the pursuit of advocacy in adulthood. Through her book, Lori shares her story, offering hope and encouragement to others who may be facing their own struggles. Driven by her unwavering commitment to support survivors of abuse and neglect, Lori has co-founded the National Foundation to End Child Abuse and Neglect, NCAN, alongside her childhood doctor and now dear friend, Dick Krugman. This organization aims to shed light on the pervasive issue of child abuse and neglect while providing vital resources and support to affected children and families. Lori's collaborative efforts with Dr. Krugman reflect her determination to tackle child abuse not merely as a social issue, but as a mental health and public health crisis that demands urgent attention and comprehensive solutions. Lori stands tall at 5 feet 6 inches, but her true stature lies in the profound impact she's made through her work and her unwavering commitment to making a difference. She continues to touch lives with her story, offering support, understanding, and hope to those who have faced similar challenges. Despite her traumatic experiences, which still haunt her, Lori remains resolute and steadfast in her pursuit of justice, healing, and support for survivors. The effects of what she endured continue to ripple through her life, manifesting in challenges such as fear of abandonment, anxiety, and depression. However, Lori's never shied away from a battle. She embraces her survival instincts, continually pushing forward and refusing to be silenced. Lori's personal mantra reflects her indomitable spirit. I only know how to survive, and I will continue to survive. Her unwavering determination and resilience serve as a beacon of hope and inspiration for all those who have experienced abuse and those who have felt compelled to remain silent. Through her own journey of healing, she's become a guiding light for others, offering them hope, healing, and the possibility of a brighter future. Lori Poland, MA, LPC, RRT, is not just a therapist and an advocate. She's a symbol of the transformative power of turning pain into purpose. As a dedicated mother of three, Lori's love extends beyond her professional endeavors, nurturing and cherishing her own family. Her impact and influence extend across the country as she travels, speaking on the topics of hope, healing, and the boundless possibilities that lie within every individual's reach. Through it all, Lori Poland found solace and strength in her recovery. 
Her resilience and unwavering determination to heal inspired her to pursue a path of helping others as a therapist, drawing upon her own journey of survival to offer hope and healing. Lori's story serves as a reminder that no matter how daunting the challenges may be, healing is possible, and a brighter future awaits those who find the courage to confront their past and advocate for change. Her unwavering commitment to supporting survivors and ending child abuse and neglect serves as an inspiration to us all. Do you think that Robert's sentence was adequate for his crimes? What do you think would be the perfect punishment for individuals like him who prey on the young and weak? A young Indian student has been killed after an online date went terribly wrong. He was a very humble personality, uh, very jolly nature. He used to crack jokes. And the woman in custody over the attack on Morlan, she's expected to have her charges upgraded. On Monday, July 23rd, 2018, an emergency call was made to the Sunbury Police Station in Melbourne, Australia at 9 p.m. The call was so strange and disturbing that the police weren't sure whether to believe it or not. The female caller calmly confessed to killing someone and enjoying it. When officers were dispatched to the address, they recognized the young woman who answered the door as 19-year-old Jamie Lee Dulligai. Inside the apartment, they found 25-year-old Maulin Rathod lying motionless in the bedroom. As Maulin was rushed to hospital, Jamie was taken in for questioning. Officers were about to uncover a twisted tale of fetishes and fantasies. What led to the fateful meeting between Jamie and Maulin? And what transpired that led to such a tragic incident? The coastal city of Melbourne in southern Australia is the capital of the state of Victoria. With a population of over 5 million, Melbourne has been voted the most livable city in the world for seven straight years. It's also known for being one of the safest cities in the world. Considered a cultural melting pot, the city combines stunning architecture and a vibrant art scene to offer residents a unique living experience while drawing millions of tourists each year to its sunny shores. Apart from the beautiful vistas, the city's home to top-tier infrastructure, a robust healthcare system, and quality educational institutions, one of the many things that attracted Malin Raythod to pursue his higher education in Melbourne. Malin Raythod was born in Ahmedabad in the state of Gurujat, India. He was the only child of Hiran and Jagrudi Raythod. Malin grew up in a humble home and enjoyed playing and watching cricket. He was described by friends and family as a modest person with a jolly nature, who was also hardworking and ambitious. He was a very humble personality, uh, very jolly nature. He used to crack jokes and he loved to play cr cricket. After completing his high school education, Mullen pursued an undergraduate degree in accounting. Upon completing the course, he applied for a student visa to further his studies at the Charles Sturt University in Melbourne, Australia. His parents were supportive of his choices and sold their bungalow in India to finance his studies in Australia. At the age of 21, Mullen made the move to Melbourne and began living in the suburb of Elsternwick. Mullen worked as a delivery driver to support himself as an international student. Mullen remained very close to his parents and called them almost every day. He also proved to be a diligent student and earned good grades while at university. His professors were so impressed with his dedication and work ethic that he was offered a permanent job at the university upon completing his studies. Mullen was four months away from completing his master's degree in accounting when tragedy struck. In the early evening of July 23, 2018, Mullen logged onto the popular dating site Plenty of Fish. While looking through several profiles, he came across one that caught his attention. The profile belonged to a 19-year-old woman named Jamie Lee Dolligai. Her online profile intrigued Mullen. She was upfront and honest about her issues with mental health on her profile and also expressed her deepest, darkest desires. At around 7 p.m., Mullen messaged Jamie on the dating site. They exchanged several flirtatious messages. Jamie confided in Mullen about her interest in fantasy roleplay and obsession with vampires. Curious and interested, Mullen allegedly promised Jamie that he'd do anything she wanted to try. They arranged to meet at Jamie's apartment in Sunbury, Melbourne later that night. Jamie promised him she'd put on a costume and use her favorite perfume. Shortly after 8 p.m., Mala knocked on Jamie's apartment door. After some small talk, the two of them spoke about what they were planning to do that night. 
Jamie expressed her interest in roleplay, and Mullen told her he was keen to experiment with her. They agreed that Mullen would tap out when things got too rough for him. The two of them engaged in very rough intimate acts and continued toward Jamie's bedroom. It was then that things took a turn for the worse. While engaging in what Jamie referred to as choke play, Mullen started to tap out. Jamie, however, had become too absorbed in the game and started to choke Mullen with an electrical cord. He eventually lost consciousness. Jamie then called the Sunbury Police Department to report that she'd just killed Mullen. When police officers and paramedics arrived at the apartment, Jamie answered the door. Police officers knew Jamie and the address very well. They'd been called by several neighbors over the years to report violent disturbances at Jamie's apartment. These included physical altercations with friends and Jamie's strange animal-like delusions. Emergency services entered the apartment and found Mullen in the bedroom. He was unconscious and barely breathing. An electrical cord from an adult toy had been wrapped around his neck. Mullen was stabilized by paramedics and rushed to the Sunshine Hospital in St. Albans, Melbourne. Jamie was taken aside by officers and asked a few questions about what had happened to Mullen. She became hysterical and began to shout at officers, accusing them of not believing her and insisted that she'd killed Mullen. Jamie was arrested and taken to the police station where she was charged with attempted murder and recklessly causing serious injury. After being booked into custody, Jamie was taken in for questioning so that officers could get a clear picture of what had occurred in her apartment that night. Little did they know, they were about to hear a story that was equal parts disturbing and bizarre. Jamie told officers she'd logged into the dating app Plenty of Fish earlier that evening to check for new messages. It was then that she saw Mullen's messages and decided to start a conversation with him. Jamie explained to officers that she was having one of her bad days, and after speaking to Mullen, the feeling had grown worse. Once they agreed to meet, Jamie knew she wanted to kill him that night. She then went online and began to search for ways to kill someone. She clicked on a link called 10 Steps for Committing a Murder and Getting Away with It. When Mullen arrived at her apartment after 8 p.m., she began sizing him up and realized she could easily overpower and strangle him. Jamie told Mullen that she wanted to do some role play, to which she quickly agreed. Jamie described Mullen as being eager to try anything she suggested, even when she warned him that things could get dangerous. She repeatedly told Mullen that she had psychopathic tendencies and was not going to let him out of the house. Mullen, however, seemed eager to experiment and assured her that he wasn't scared. All Mullen asked her was not to hurt him. Jamie agreed that when things got too rough, he could tap and she'd immediately stop the game. However, Jamie confessed to officers that in her mind, it was never going to be a game. From the moment she agreed to meet Mullen, she knew he would be her victim. She explained to officers that she had two different personalities. One was mean and destructive, the other one was caring and nice. Jamie said that the entire time she had Mullen in her apartment, she had hoped he'd get scared, run away, and call the police, but he kept going along with the game. Jamie said she eventually started choking Mullen from behind with her bare hands. It was then the overwhelming urge to kill him grew intense. Mullen started to panic, and his fear felt enticing to Jamie. When Mullen started to tap, she squeezed harder and wrapped her legs around his body to get a tighter grip. She described whispering in his ear that it was all going to be okay and that everything would be over soon. By then, Mullen was in a full-blown panic and tried to wriggle out of Jamie's grip, but she sat on his back to prevent his escape. In a matter of seconds, Mullen went limp. Still riding the high of attempted murder, Jamie looked for something to strangle him with. She tried a USB cable at first, but it wasn't strong enough. She then found an adult toy and wrapped the thicker electrical cord around his neck. Baffled by Jamie's confession, officers asked her what drove her to commit the crime. Jamie compared her urge to kill with wanting to smoke a cigarette. Jamie confessed to police that before calling the station, she'd gone online once again. This time, she'd looked up ways to be admitted to hospital after committing a murder. The interview grew more disturbing as the hours went by. Jamie spilled her soul to officers, describing her darkest fantasies and secret urges. She was still at the police station in the early morning hours of Tuesday, July 24, 2018, when officers received tragic news from the hospital. 
Mullen had succumbed to his injuries. The cause of his death was strangulation. Jamie's charges of attempted murder were upgraded to murder in the first degree. She was detained at the Sunbury police station as news of Mullen's death started to reach the media. Lovepreet Singh, a friend of Mullen's from university, was contacted by police to help identify his body. After they confirmed that the victim was indeed Mullen, police contacted his parents in India. Both Hiran and Jagrudi had been contacted by Singh on Monday morning. Singh had told Mullen's parents that he'd been injured and was taken to hospital. They were in the process of getting their visas approved to fly to Australia when police gave them the tragic news. As news of Mullen's death started to spread through Melbourne, Jamie too became a focus of media attention. The details of the crime disturbed and shook the normally safe and quiet community. But as Jamie's involvement in the crime came to light, those who knew her were not surprised that she'd committed such a heinous crime. It was soon revealed that Jamie was no stranger to law enforcement and had a very disturbing past of her own. Jamie Lee Dolagai was born in October 1998 in Melbourne, Australia. Not much is known about her early life, except that she was raised in an abusive household. When Jamie was 10 years old, she and her siblings were removed from their home after her father repeatedly assaulted her mother in their presence. Social workers also discovered that Jamie and her siblings were victims of their father's anger. Jamie had lived in state care since being removed from her parents' home, but life didn't get any easier. Jamie's past trauma led to her developing a destructive personality. By the age of 14, she already had a lengthy criminal record and had done several stints in juvenile detention centers. Social workers reported that Jamie showed signs of borderline personality disorder and was prone to harming herself. She was then moved to a safe home by the Department of Health and Human Services. Teenage Jamie was placed under 24-hour surveillance and cared for by two state-appointed caregivers. However, upon turning 18, Jamie was left to live by herself as she was considered an adult by the state. It was after she was given her freedom that things became worse. Neighbors often reported Jamie for noise disturbance and fighting, occasionally requesting welfare checks. Every time police or social workers visited Jamie, she'd usually turn up a few days later at the police station or welfare offices with cakes and cards thanking them for supporting her. Jamie was known to switch between being violent and reckless to sweet and kind-hearted in an instant. And like millions of teenagers around her, Jamie had taken to social media like a duck to water. She was known to upload pictures and write lengthy posts throughout the day on her various accounts. She shared numerous pictures of herself online. Some showed her dressed in costumes, others were simple pictures with multiple filters added for different effects. She even uploaded some of her personal artwork. Her social media post painted a picture of a very troubled young woman. Jamie wrote long paragraphs detailing her traumatic childhood and the physical assault she'd endured at the hands of her father. She also wrote about her struggles with self-loathing, body image issues, and poor self-esteem. She made rants about hating skinny pretty girls online and wrote at length about how she wanted to torture them. In some posts, she wrote about several attempts she'd made to take her own life and admitted to putting batteries in her body. This resulted in her having over a hundred surgeries to remove foreign objects from her body. Jamie was obsessed with darkness and vampire mythology. One of her friends even claimed that Jamie often told her she had a demon inside that wanted to come out every so often. The same friend, who wanted to remain anonymous, said that Jamie would suddenly start snarling and growling like a wolf at times. She'd even bite people who were standing too close when this happened. The friend described Jamie as being possessed, a claim that was repeated by multiple caregivers who had lived with Jamie while she was placed in the safe house. The caregivers described Jamie as a shape-shifting demon girl who was unpredictable and could flip a switch at any moment. A few weeks before Mullen's tragic murder, Jamie uploaded a disturbing post on social media. It had been a clear cry for help. In the post, she stated that no one believed her whenever she said she was not sane. She lived in constant fear of what lay behind the corners of her blackened heart. Jamie also wrote that she could no longer feel emotions or happiness. The only time she ever felt something was when she watched other people suffer. On the afternoon of July 23, 2018, hours before she murdered Mullen, Jamie sent one of her former caregivers a text message. 
In the message, she said that she was feeling really sick with herself. She expressed that she had bad temptations and wanted to call the police, but knew they wouldn't believe her if she explained these feelings to them. Hours later, Jamie's evil temptation would become a reality and Mullen would be the victim of a senseless crime. Everyone involved in the case knew how complicated the situation was from the outset. Looking back at Jamie's past, prosecutors and investigators knew that the childhood trauma she'd endured had left her scarred for life. But she was not the victim in this case. It was Mullen Rathod, a young man with big dreams and the only child of two hardworking parents. Those dreams had been snuffed out by a young woman facing her own demons. In order to serve justice on behalf of Mullen and his parents, prosecutors and investigators hired the best clinical minds in Australia to assess Jamie psychologically. Meanwhile, Mullen's friends and colleagues in Australia helped raise funds to have his body returned to India so that his last rites could be performed in his home country. Mullen was cremated in India 12 days after his death. Over the next year, several psychologists studied and analyzed Jamie's behavior and how her past affected her actions. It was unanimously agreed by the clinical team that Jamie was one of the most psychologically damaged and troubled subjects they'd studied. Jamie was described as a ticking time bomb. After all the tests and assessments were carried out, Jamie was deemed fit to stand trial at the end of 2019. Jamie's trial began in late November 2019 at the Victoria Supreme Court presided over by Justice Peter Almond. Jamie's case was heard before a jury. Mullen's parents in India were unable to attend the trial due to financial constraints, but they were kept up to date by his friends in Australia. Although she'd already confessed to the murder on several occasions, Jamie entered a plea of not guilty before the trial began. No one in the courtroom had any doubt that Jamie was responsible for killing Mullen. The argument instead focused on how Jamie's mental health had affected her decision-making and whether murderous intent could be proven. Jamie's defense lawyer, Sharon Lacey, pushed for the charge of murder to be dropped to the lesser charge of manslaughter. Lacey focused her argument around Jamie's childhood trauma and borderline personality disorder diagnosis. She argued that Jamie was severely damaged by childhood trauma and had suffered from stunted psychological development. She touched on Jamie's living conditions and the numerous times she attempted to harm herself. Lacey pointed out her client's lack of understanding of the enormity of the situation. Lacey argued that no jury could be sure that Jamie had any murderous intent and therefore she couldn't be found guilty of murder. A Sunbury woman who choked an Indian university student to death only hours after meeting him on a dating app has been acquitted of murder. Jamie Lee Dollagai admitted she felt good after strangling her victim, but a jury found she did not intend to kill him. In court, Jamie's behavior played into her defense team's argument. She sat quietly coloring pictures, drawing, and making origami. During the trial, Dollagai smiled to herself as she drew pictures using coloured pencils. Today, however, she simply stared at the floor. Her lawyers say they need until April next year to compile all of her psychiatric reports. Jamie didn't seem to be focused on the case. She occasionally even smiled at the jury before returning to the activity she was occupied with. The prosecution was not deterred by the defence's argument. They admitted that Jamie had indeed suffered a great deal of trauma in her childhood, which had clearly affected her mental health. But they pointed out that Jamie knew beforehand that she was going to kill Mullen. Their proof was in the internet searches she'd made and the confessions she'd given to police officers about her desire to kill. They pointed out that in her confession, she admitted to sizing Mullen up and deciding it would be easy to kill him. The prosecution said that by her own admission, Jamie had given a detailed play-by-play -play of how she'd enjoyed the act of murder. The prosecution alluded to the social media posts, text messages sent to caregivers, and internet searches as being a strong basis for premeditated murder. After an 18-day-long trial, with several witnesses giving testimony on Jamie's behavior over the years, it was left up to the jury to decide the final verdict. When asked if there was any sign of murderous intent, the jurors said they'd found none during deliberations. Instead, they moved to convict Jamie on the lesser charge of manslaughter, which in Australia carries a maximum sentence of 20 years. On December 20th, 2019, Jamie Lee Dollagai was found guilty of manslaughter for the death of Mullen Rathod. The following year, on October 22nd, 2020, 
Jamie Lee Dolagai was sentenced to nine years in prison with a minimum term of five years. Judge Almond credited Jamie for the two years she'd already spent in prison, which could possibly see her getting released within three years depending on her behavior. Jamie Lee Dolagai still has homicidal urges and she has threatened to kill another inmate. For now, she remains locked up in maximum security. But she could be freed on parole in just over three years. Following the sentencing, many felt hurt by the lenient sentence delivered to Jamie. Opinions remain divided over her innocence due to past trauma and severe mental health issues. Since there is also the glaring evidence that Jamie knew what she was doing, particularly with the internet searches she made before and after Mullen's murder. But the people most affected by Mullen's untimely death were his parents. The last time they ever saw their son was during the kite flying festival in 2018, when Mullen had returned to India for a visit. Both Hiran and Jagrudi were invited to attend a court hearing for the case in February 2020. At the hearing, they spoke about the pain of losing their only child and how their lives had been turned upside down. They only asked that the Australian court hand Jamie a harsh punishment for what she'd done. Their visit to Australia also allowed them a glimpse into the incredible strides Mullen had made for himself. Mullen's professors at the university remembered him as a brilliant student who worked hard and was bound to achieve great things in life. Hiran and Jagrudi were also grateful to those in Australia who had helped support them and assisted in the repatriation of Mullen's remains to India. Hiran fondly remembered Mullen wanting both him and his wife to leave India and move to Australia where he could support them. Mullen wanted to give back to his parents in the same way they'd always supported him. Hiran and Jagrudi continue to live in India, but the death of their only child haunts them to this day. With each passing year, they get older and feel the loneliness in their lives. However, they've come to accept what's happened and understand that nothing will bring Mullen back. All they can do is keep his memory alive in their hearts for as long as they live. How can I help you? Yes, uh, my daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just the least shock. What is your name? My name is Ron, and except her husband, Scott Peterson, is on way over the park. Christmas of 2002 was unlike any other in Modesto, California. Instead of the usual festive greetings and treats, determined dairy farmers scoured neighborhoods and farm fields on foot and horseback in search of 27-year-old Lacey Peterson, who had been seven months pregnant. Lacey's family and friends established a mission control center at a downtown hotel. They distributed around 25,000 flyers to an army of eager volunteers. The effort to find Lacey extended far beyond Modesto, reaching places like Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, and even Mexico, where her smiling face appeared on shop windows and utility poles as the case made national headlines. Who was Lacey Peterson, and where did she go? In the heart of sunny California, where golden fields stretch as far as the eye can see, a small city called Modesto lies nestled amidst the tranquil embrace of the Central Valley. It's a place where the pace of life gently mirrors the flow of the nearby Tuolumne River. Its tight-knit community thrives on its strong sense of unity and family values that run deep. Modesto's tree-lined streets and charming neighborhoods provide an idyllic setting for families to put down roots. This was the place where Lacey Peterson chose to settle down. Little did Lacey know, that the serene landscape of Modesto was capable of hiding dark and ugly secrets, too. This tale begins with the love story of Lacey's parents, Sharon Anderson and Dennis Robert Rocha. They were high school sweethearts who tied the knot and became the proud owners of a dairy farm near Escalon, California. In 1971, they had their first baby, who they named Brent Rocha. Then, Sharon was pregnant once more, and on May 4, 1975, their family was blessed with the arrival of a baby girl. She was named Lacey Dennis Rocha. She had been a happy person since childhood, and her beautiful smile captivated all who knew her. Right from the time when her mother, Sharon, would pick her up out of the crib, unlike other babies who cried a lot, 
Sharon always found Lacey smiling. Lacey grew up working on the family farm with her mother and loved gardening in nature. Not every love story has a happy ending, and that's what happened in the case of Lacey's parents, Sharon and Dennis. Her parents divorced when she was young, and she moved with her mom to Modesto. Her mom later married Ron Gransky, who played a big role in Lacey and her brother Brent's lives from a young age. Lacey attended Downey High School in Modesto and had fun with friends at sneaky slumber parties with drinks. They would all end up super drunk, yet somehow, Lacey always managed to attend school the next day. Later, she pursued her passion for ornamental horticulture, earning an Outstanding Freshman Award at California Polytechnic State University after her 1993 graduation. While Lacey was maturing and pursuing her studies, on the other side of town, Lacey's husband-to-be was also beginning his adult life. Born on October 24, 1972 in San Diego, California, Scott Peterson was the only child of Lee and Jackie Peterson, who had six children combined from previous marriages. Jackie's difficult childhood, marked by her father's murder and being raised by nuns, inspired her to provide the best possible life for her children. As a kid, Scott lived in a two-bedroom apartment in La Jolla, California with his family and shared a room with his half-brother, John. Scott was deeply passionate about golf. At just 14, he was already beating his dad at the game. He even dreamed of becoming a pro golfer at one point. He went to college at Arizona State University in 1990 on a partial golf scholarship, but made a mistake when he took another golfer, Chris Couch, for drinks when Chris was visiting the university for a possible spot on the golf team. As a result, Scott was removed from the team. Even so, his professors had only good things to say about him and thought he was a model student. Scott worked at Pacific Cafe in Morro Bay during college. Lacey saw Scott while visiting a friend who worked there and made the first move. In mid-1994, she gave Scott her number, even telling her mother he was the one. Their first date was a deep-sea fishing trip where Lacey got seasickness. It would have been a bad date ideally, but for them, it was memorable. Within one week, Sharon, Lacey's mother, finally got to meet Scott. Lacey took her mother to the Pacific Cafe where Scott had gone out of the way to make both the ladies feel special. He had placed a dozen red roses for Lacey on the table, and to add to the charm, he placed a dozen white roses for Sharon as well. He definitely received some brownie points for that. After that, Lacey knew she was in love. As their relationship got more serious, Scott decided to put his dreams of becoming a pro golfer on hold so he could focus on building a career in business. They dated for about two years and then decided to move in together. In 1997, after Lacey finished college, they got married at Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort. Scott graduated in 1998 and they started a sports bar called The Shack. Later, they moved to Modesto, California and bought a house. Lacey substituted as a teacher and Scott got a job at a fertilizer company. With Scott's good income, Lacey embraced homemaking. Her days began with walking her dog Mackenzie, followed by cooking, hosting friends, and enjoying Martha Stewart's shows. Everyone thought that Lacey could not smile any wider, but that changed in 2002 when Lacey found out she was expecting a baby, due on February 10th, 2003. Lacey was overjoyed. The parents-to-be had already decided to name their son Connor. But Lacey would soon learn that not all fairy tales have happy endings. On December 23rd, 2002, Lacey and Scott had a busy day. They went to Salon Salon, where Lacey's sister Amy worked. They had been going there every month for Scott to get a haircut. Scott also offered to pick up a fruit basket for Amy and bought his wife a lovely present for Christmas. Lacey's mother, Sharon, talked to Lacey on the phone around 8.30 that evening. Then the next day, on Christmas Eve 2002, Lacey did not pull open the curtains like she usually did. It was one of the little things that Lacey did that the neighbors noticed was off. 
However, Scott saw Lacey at around 9.30 a.m. when he was leaving the house. She had been watching a Martha Stewart show about meringue and getting ready to mop the floor, bake cookies, and take their dog Mackenzie to the nearby park as she did every day. Strangely, around 10.30 a.m., Lacey's neighbor, Karen Servas, found Mackenzie loose in the front yard with its collar and leash still on. Lacey was nowhere around. Another neighbor, Mike Chiavetta, saw Mackenzie at about 10.45 a.m. while playing with his own dog. It was definitely odd. It was the first sign that something was terribly wrong. At some point, one of the neighbors who knew Mackenzie put her back in her own yard, believing she had accidentally gotten out. Scott left a message for Lacey at 2.15 p.m., telling her that he was leaving Berkeley. After returning home that afternoon, he noticed Lacey's car in the driveway. Yet the house was empty, but Mackenzie was in the backyard. Scott went to ask some neighbors if they had seen Lacey. When the neighbors asked him if he tried calling her, Scott replied in affirmation and told them that he had gone out golfing that day and now his wife was missing. Scott called his mother-in-law Sharon to check if Lacey was with her. That was the first time that Sharon was alerted that her daughter, Lacey, had gone missing. She knew that Lacey was not the type of person to go somewhere without informing someone. So, Scott and Lacey's stepfather both reported her missing, and police received the report shortly before 6 p.m. Mom, can I help you? Yes, uh, my daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. Dog came home with some police shots. What is your name? My name is Ron. Her husband, Scott Peterson, is on way over the park. Police could sense something amiss with the case and had their suspicions of foul play quite early on. Modesto police detectives Alan Bracchini and John Bueller, who were leading the investigation, went to the Petersons home after they received the missing person call. When they got there, they found Lacey's keys, wallet and sunglasses in her purse inside a closet. That clearly meant that Lacey had not planned to go out and also it meant that this was not a robbery case either. By now, many people had gathered around the Peterson house. Whenever someone new came and asked Scott where he had been when Lacey went missing, he always replied saying that he had gone golfing. In such cases, detectives usually look to the spouse first. However, Scott managed to deflect suspicion when his in-laws and Lacey's parents vouched for him, painting a picture of Scott and Lacey as the perfect couple. But then, how did a young woman who was seven and a half months pregnant suddenly disappear? The day after Lacey went missing, on Christmas of 2002, the Modesto police and firefighters began a large search mission along Dry Creek. They pulled out all the stops, using helicopters with searchlights, officers on horses and bikes, police dogs, and even water rescue teams on rafts. About 30 officers were involved, along with Lacey's family, friends, and volunteers who put up flyers to spread the word about her disappearance. Lacey's close friends, with whom she had grown apart from over time, all came together to join the search. She had brought them together once again, like she did in high school. Only this time, Lacey herself was not there. Scott had called many of them, asking if they'd seen Lacey on Christmas Eve but none had. They flocked to her house, the very place where they had shared countless joyful moments. Lacey's friend, Renee Tomlinson, said, It just wasn't right. This was not a sad place. To be sad at her house just wasn't right. Lacey's immediate family and friends organized the initial search and a later vigil. In the first couple of days, almost 900 people were out looking for Lacey before the police and community officials joined in and before it became a big news story nationwide. The Carol Sun Carrington Memorial Reward Foundation, along with help from Lacey's family, offered a reward of $25,000, which was later increased to $250,000 and then to $500,000 for any information that could help find Lacey. They made posters, 
tied blue and yellow ribbons, and spread flyers. They also set up a basic website called LaceyPeterson.com, which was started by a friend's husband. All of her dear ones and random volunteers worked together at a nearby Red Lion Hotel, where they kept track of any updates and shared information. More than 1,500 volunteers signed up to help distribute information and search for Lacey. Everyone was tense and wanted desperately to know how, why, and what had happened to Lacey. Naturally, the case quickly grabbed the attention of the national media. The public was sympathetic towards Scott. After all, his wife and unborn son had just vanished. However, as the police investigation continued, sympathy was quickly replaced by suspicion. The very first doubts about Scott began to percolate in Detective Bueller's mind early on in the investigation. He had his suspicions about Scott from the very first time he met him. It wasn't necessarily he thought Scott was guilty, but Scott's calm and composed demeanor struck him as odd. Scott didn't ask questions like, can you give me your contact details? Or, what's the plan now? Detective Bueller described Scott as a bit of a mystery. He seemed polite, yet arrogant, distant, yet impatient. Scott didn't appear to be deeply upset or disturbed by his wife's disappearance, which raised some red flags. But again, after handling many such cases, detectives are well aware that everyone grieves differently. It was officially time to look into and track alibis. The first in line was the spouse, Scott. You'd have no idea where this is. Just tell me about the morning. We got up at, I don't know, 8 o'clock probably or so. Uh, showered. We were watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart. A little bit of that. He's been married four years. Yeah. Four or five. I guess it's five. I think we're married in 97. So you're married in 97? Please so. Unlike what he mentioned to others, he told police he had gone fishing for sturgeon in his new 14-foot aluminum boat at the Berkeley Marina, which was about 90 miles away from their home in Modesto. During questioning, Scott remained calm. He did not seem impatient or angry with the detectives for wasting their time on him, nor did he seem remotely concerned. The doubts were now piling up. So the police immediately organized a search into Scott's background. By this time, it had already been about a week since Lacey disappeared. Then, on December 30th, 2002, a woman named Amber Fry, a massage therapist by profession, was watching the news when she realized that she knew the man on the screen. She knew Scott very well. In fact, she was dating him. So it was an utter shock for her when she found out that Scott's wife had been missing. Because... Scott told her he was a widower. Was that a mere coincidence, or had Scott already been planning his wife's demise? Amber immediately notified the police. During her interview with detectives, she detailed that they had met on November 20, 2002. At that time, Scott portrayed himself as an eligible bachelor. But after almost a month, on December 9, he confessed that he had previously been married but his wife had died. Scott appealed to Amber's emotions by telling her that it would have been his first Christmas without his wife, which of course, turned out to be true. Amber agreed to help the investigators by allowing them to record her conversations with Scott on the phone, hoping to get him to confess. On January 15, 2003, the police informed Lacey's immediate family about Scott's affair and showed her mother Sharon and stepfather Ron a photo of Scott with Amber. At this point, Sharon started to believe that Scott might have been involved in Lacey's disappearance. In fact, it turned out that Scott and Lacey's all-too-perfect relationship was far from that in reality. Obviously, Scott's romantic side was not exclusive to Lacey. On January 17, 2003, it was revealed that Scott had been involved in two other affairs before Amber Fry, but no public information has been made available about his prior dalliances. On January 24, 
Sharon, Ron, and Lacey's brother Brent told the press that they were withdrawing their support for Scott, even though he hadn't officially been named as a suspect. Just hours later, Amber Fry held a press conference where she explained her role in the investigation. Did your wife find out about it? I told my wife. When? In, um, early December. Did it cause a rupture in the marriage? It was not um, a positive, obviously. It's, a, you know, inappropriate. Um, but it was not something that we weren't um, dealing with. A lot of arguing? No, um, I, I, you know, I can't say that even, you know, she was okay with the idea. But uh, it wasn't anything that would break us apart. There wasn't a lot of anger? No. So far, Scott had lied about pretty much everything he told detectives, as well as Amber. So, who would believe that what he was telling about Lacey's reaction was true? Do you really expect people to believe that an eight and a half month pregnant woman learns her husband has had an affair and is saintly and casual about it? Accommodating? Makes a peace with it? Well, I, yeah, I, you don't know. No one knows our relationship with us. Lacey's brother Brent revealed that Scott had admitted to him in a phone call on January 16, 2003, that he had been having an affair with yet another woman from Fresno during that time. However, by the end of January 2003, Scott was no longer communicating with the Rocha family. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months with no news about Lacey. Her family and friends hadn't seen her smile for so long, and they just wanted to hear some good news, even when hope seemed to be lost. It was on April 13, 2003, when a couple was walking their dog at Point Isabel Regional Shoreline Park and saw something on the shoreline near the San Francisco Bay. They couldn't have witnessed a sadder scene. In front of them was the body of the dead fetus of a boy. It was in pretty bad shape, but the umbilical cord was still attached, although it seemed like it had been torn rather than cut properly as it should be after a baby is born. Just a day after that terrible discovery, on April 14th, someone else found a woman's body on the rocky shoreline about a mile away from where they found the baby. They could tell that this woman had been pregnant recently but her body was in such bad condition that it was almost unrecognizable as a human body. She had been decapitated and part of her limbs were missing, including most of her legs. It was a horrible sight. The police immediately sent the bodies for DNA testing. On April 18, 2003, the reports revealed that these were indeed the bodies of Lacey and her unborn son, Connor. To say that it was a heartbreaking discovery would be an understatement. The bodies were sent for autopsy in the hopes that they might be able to discover something that could explain what happened to them. Dr. Brian Peterson, who examined both bodies, reported that when he looked at Connor's body, he noticed that his skin was not decomposed at all, but the right side of his body had been injured. They discovered that there were 1.5 loops of nylon tape around the baby's neck and that there were lacerations and cuts on his body. It was unclear if he was harmed intentionally, but a plausible theory was that he had come in contact with garbage while floating in the San Francisco Bay Area. Also, unlike what was reported earlier, the placenta and umbilical cord were not present with the baby during the autopsy. However, the medical examiners did find meconium in the baby's bowels, which is the first stool a baby passes after birth. As for Lacey, Dr. Peterson said that they found a tape on her lower torso outside her clothing, and he further speculated she may have died from strangulation or smothering, but it was really hard to figure out when and how she died. Even though her head and neck were missing, along with her forearms and all internal organs except for the uterus, her cervix was undamaged. She did have two cracked ribs, but it could not be determined if they happened before or after her death. 
Her upper torso was devoid of internal organs except for her uterus, which protected the baby and kept it from decomposing as much as the rest of her body. Dr. Peterson concluded that the baby passed away inside Lacey's body and was later expelled from her decaying body. When they found the bodies, the detectives, Brockini and Bueller, knew that they had to act fast. They had placed a tracker on Scott's car and knew he was in San Diego at the time. They were worried he might try to escape to Mexico because San Diego is pretty close to the Mexican border. Scott was familiar with the area because his parents lived there, so he would not even need directions to get to Tijuana. The detectives weren't positive of Scott's guilt, but their years of combined experience was enough for them to know that he had something to do with all of this. He was definitely the main, in fact, the one and only, suspect in the case. The FBI and the local police searched Scott's home carefully. They even tested a hair they found on some pliers in his fishing boat. Later, they would find that the hair was a match for Lacey's hair, which they found on her hairbrush. They also went through Scott's pickup truck, toolbox, warehouse, and boat. It was about time that investigators got some damning evidence against him. In his boat, they discovered a homemade anchor that Scott had made just two weeks earlier. He told them he used a 90-pound bag of concrete to make it and used the rest to fix his driveway. When they searched Scott's warehouse, they found a cement-like substance on the wooden bed of a boat trailer. Detective Hendy, who was part of the investigation, noticed that there were five circular areas on the trailer that had less powder than the rest. He also found a dustpan with the same white powder and a sledgehammer. The evidence was not enough to prove that Scott was definitely the killer. However, officers believed that he had made five anchors and used four of them to sink Lacey's body in the San Francisco Bay. Scott was arrested on April 13, 2003, near a golf course in La Jolla, where he was supposed to meet his father and brother for a round of golf. By then, he looked like a changed man, at least in physical appearance. He had dyed his naturally dark brown hair blonde, and his Mercedes was filled with all sorts of things like cash, Viagra pills, camping gear, clothes, four cell phones, and even two driver's licenses, his and his brother's. Scott's dad, Lee Peterson, explained that Scott had used his brother's license the day before to get a discount at the golf course. He also said that Scott had been living in his car because the media attention was too much. But the police believed that these things meant he was planning to run away to Mexico. On April 21, 2003, Scott made his first appearance in court in Stanislaus County. There, he was charged with two very serious crimes, murder with premeditation and special circumstances. He pled not guilty. However, because so many people in Stanislaus County had already made their minds about Scott, the judge decided to move his trial to San Mateo County. Scott's trial began on June 1, 2004, with Rick DeStasso as prosecutor and Mark Garagos as defense attorney. The motives seemed clear enough to the prosecutors. A man killed his wife because she was in the way of his affair. He was tired of marriage. He could not handle the responsibility of being a father yet, and he could not manage the financial burden. The defense accepted that Scott was a two-timer, but it was no reason to claim that he would murder his wife. They argued he would not have chucked this entire life he had for a masseuse mistress he had taken on only four dates. Since the investigators lacked any significant direct proof, the prosecution relied on circumstantial evidence. Several witnesses testified that Scott changed his appearance mere days after his wife's disappearance. He purchased a vehicle using his mother's name and even added two adult television channels to his cable service within days. Neighbors were called in to establish that Scott told everyone that he had been golfing on December 24, 2002, not fishing. His financial status was also investigated, and it turned out that the couple had managed to accumulate $23,000 in credit card debt. The DNA hair match was also questioned. 
The defense pointed out that mitochondrial testing was not considered a reliable means of DNA comparison. But the prosecution knew what they were talking about. In fact, they claimed that Lacey hadn't even seen the boat while she was alive. Speaking on behalf of Scott, attorneys theorized that someone kidnapped Lacey, held her until she gave birth, and then dumped both bodies in the bay. But the medical examiners had already established that both Lacey and the baby died at the same time. Finally, after hearing both sides, on November 12, 2004, the jury found Scott Peterson guilty of murdering his own wife. On March 16, 2005, Judge DeLuke addressed the court and called Lacey and Connor's murders as cruel, uncaring, heartless, and callous. Finally, the judge sentenced Scott to death by lethal injection and ordered him to pay $10,000 toward the cost of Lacey's funeral. Scott reached San Quentin State Prison on March 17, 2005, very early in the morning. According to an officer, he didn't sleep the night before because he was too jazzed up. Scott was put in a special cell on death row. He would stay there for a few weeks while authorities figured out where his long-term placement would be. On July 5, 2012, Scott's defense team contested the death sentence and filed an appeal in the Supreme Court of California to overturn the decision on the grounds of unfair trial. Finally, on December 8, 2021, California Superior Court Judge Anne Christine Masulo upheld Scott's conviction, but ruled that he would be resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the first-degree murder of Lacey. He also received a concurrent sentence of 15 years for the second-degree murder of Connor. Years passed by, but no one forgot Lacey. On April 8, 2018, Ron Gransky, Lacey's stepfather, who was like a second father to her, peacefully passed away in his sleep at his Modesto home at the age of 71. He had been facing health challenges for quite some time. Ron was laid to rest in a cemetery in Escalon, right next to Lacey. Then, just a few months later, on December 9, 2018, Lacey's biological father, Dennis Rocha, also passed away. Sharon Rocha was quoted as saying, she loved her dad, and now they'll be together again. Lacey, a young mother with dreams of raising her unborn son, and Connor, an innocent baby who never got the chance to take his first breath, were taken from this world too soon. It was unimaginable for Lacey's friends and family to digest the fact that her body was not even recognizable as human. It was the hardest thing they had to hear. That smile was gone forever. Scott, whose own grandfather was murdered, chose to go down that lane anyway. He chose to kill rather than just divorce Lacey. But amidst all the darkness of this case, there was also a glimmer of hope. The community rallied together in the search for Lacey, showing the power of unity in the face of tragedy. And while Lacey may have departed this world, her memory lives on in the hearts of countless people. They were introduced to her infectious smile, and her family's fervent wish is that she forever be remembered for the radiant happiness she brought into the world. Do you believe Scott killed Lacey and their unborn baby? And if so, why? Cody was really looking forward to getting married. Um, he loved children and couldn't wait to have his own. And he thought Jordan was the one for him. Newlywed accused of killing her husband just eight days after the wedding by pushing him off a cliff. Jordan Lynn Graham has now been officially charged with murder and is expected to be arraigned in court later today. Cody Johnson is a kind, loving, wonderful young man that I miss a lot. On June 29, 2013, in the heart of Kalispell, Montana, 22-year-old bride Jordan Lynn Graham and 25-year-old groom Cody Johnson exchanged vows. The lovebirds shared a love that seemed unbreakable. They were everyone's favorite couple in town. They had a great relationship, 
always seen hand in hand, smiling and planning their future together. But on July 7th, 2013, everything changed. Jordan returned from a trip alone, claiming Cody had gone off with his friends. The question on everyone's mind was, where did he go and why didn't his friends report anything? Kalispell, Montana is a thriving city in Flathead County with a population of 24,000 as of the 2020 census. Named after a Salish word meaning flat land above the lake, Kalispell boasts stunning natural landscapes and cultural heritage. As the largest city in northwest Montana, it serves as the commercial center of the Kalispell Micropolitan Statistical Area, and residents are very welcoming. Nestled in the scenic Flathead Valley, Kalispell offers easy access to Glacier National Park and Flathead Lake, a major attraction. Skiers enjoy nearby resorts like Whitefish Mountain and Blacktail Mountain. Kalispell's low crime mates make it a safe and desirable place to live, with violent crime and property crime well below the national average. This is the city where Cody Johnson lived. Cody Lee Johnson was a young man whose innate curiosity and insatiable thirst for knowledge left an indelible mark on everyone he encountered. Born on April 8, 1988, in the bustling city of San Jose, California, he was the beloved son of David Clarence and Sherry Ann Johnson. From an early age, Cody displayed a curious and adventurous nature that set him apart from his peers. Cody's dreams and aspirations reached far beyond his interests. He uh, really liked cars. That's where both of us really spent a lot of our time. But most of all, he liked to make people happy. <laughs> With an intense urge for adventure, he longed to travel the world. Ever since his childhood, he was eager to explore new cultures and make memories with new people that would last a lifetime. In 2002, Cody's life took a new turn as he moved to Montana with his mother. The beautiful landscapes and serene surroundings in Montana resonated deeply with him, and he embraced the new chapter with enthusiasm. Working at Nomad Global Communication Services in Kalispell, Cody found fulfillment in his job and forged relationships with his co-workers. His warm smile and infectious laughter brightened even the dullest days, making him an important team member. Jordan Lynn Graham was born in August 1991 in the tranquil town of Kalispell, Montana, surrounded by the breathtaking beauty of nature. Her life revolved around her strong religious beliefs. She found solace and purpose in the Faith Baptist Church, where she attended weekly worship and special events. Within the church's close-knit community, Jordan shared her dreams of a future filled with love, marriage, and starting a family. A chance encounter on Halloween in 2011 brought Cody Johnson into Jordan's life. Outgoing and passionate about cars, Cody, a 25-year-old, seemed destined to fulfill Jordan's desire for a good church-going partner. As he joined the Faith Baptist Church, he instantly bonded with Jordan's circle of friends, leaving them no doubt about his love for her. Their connection blossomed rapidly, and in December 2012, Jordan joyfully announced her engagement to Cody on Instagram. The couple's love story seemed to mirror the scenic landscape of Kalispell, moving forward with excitement and plans for their upcoming wedding. As they looked forward to their life together, Jordan and Cody appeared like a match made in heaven. To their friends and family, Jordan Lynn Graham and Cody Johnson's relationship appeared to be filled with bliss and love. Jordan Graham and Cody Johnson's wedding on June 29, 2013 was meant to be a beautiful occasion filled with music and dancing, and it was. The couple hired professional songwriter Elizabeth Shea to create a custom song, a reflection of their deep connection and love for each other. Throughout the wedding preparations, Jordan's excitement about surprising Cody with the song was evident to everyone. The couple seemed very happy, yet beneath the surface, there seemed to be an underlying unease. Eight days after their wedding, on July 7th, 2013, Jordan and Cody, still in the honeymoon phase, decided to take a hike along a cliffside in the captivating Glacier National Park, just a short journey from their hometown of Kalispell, Montana. Little did they know that this seemingly ordinary hike would mark a pivotal moment in their lives, setting in motion events that would shatter their perfect marriage. On July 8th, 2013, Cameron, Cody's boss and friend, noticed Cody wasn't in the office. He became concerned and decided to pay him a visit as he'd hoped that the newly married couple would be home. 
but when he reached there, he found no one at the house. Not wanting to take any risks, he sought help from the authorities and reported Cody Johnson missing. When the Kalispell Police Department arrived, they found Jordan Graham at home. However, when the police asked Jordan about Cody, she claimed he left with friends and had no idea where he went. However, his friends had no idea where he was either, and as if to prove that, one of them alerted the police. The investigators immediately turned their attention to Jordan Graham, as they found it suspicious that she hadn't reported her husband's disappearance. During the interview, Jordan falsely claimed to have no knowledge of Cody's whereabouts, stating that he'd sent her a text message the previous night mentioning plans to go out with friends. What's going on as far as where he might have gone or who he might be with? I got a message saying that he was going to go for a ride with some of his out-of-town buddies that were visiting. I had no idea who they were, but he always told me this one thing is when his friends came to visit, he would take them to Glacier Park. You guys weren't having any kind of argument? No. I don't know anything more any of whereabouts or anything. I'm getting some inconsistencies in what you're telling me with other information that I've already gathered, okay? Mm -hmm. And I've spoke to a few people, and it's important that I know that you're telling me the truth on things. And what I know. However, this raised more questions. If he went out with friends, why weren't they also looking for him? Most importantly, why didn't they report he was missing? Also, why didn't she report him missing when she couldn't reach him for more than 24 hours? That evening, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where he was, you know, trying to look on his Facebook page to see if he had posted anything or, you know, trying to see if she had, you know, his bank account information. Maybe we could look up and see if he used his debit card or something. The police intensified their search, but they weren't ready for the shock that was to come. It was totally out of character for him not to show up at work or come home or go to a friend's house. I didn't know what happened. On July 10th, 2013, Jordan revealed to the police that she'd received an email from someone named Carmen Tony 607, who claimed to have information about Cody's fate. The email was chilling and claimed that Cody had met with some unknown friends in Columbia Falls, where he went for a joyride with them. According to the email, Cody got out of the car during a ride to hike and fell and died. The sender, Tony, urged Jordan to call off the missing persons report as Cody was gone for sure. This email introduced a new twist to the investigation, leaving the authorities with more questions than answers. She says, look, I got this email and Cody's dead. And I'm like freaking out, like, what are you talking about? And I read the email, and it says, Cody's gone, Jordan. Any emotion? No. She wasn't crying at all. She was just showing me this email, and I start shaking. I told her to go to the cops, and she did go. Um, But I was kind of just, like, rushing it, like, go, move. Like, what are you doing? Don't just stand here looking at me. The day after receiving the mysterious email, the police took action, organizing a search of the Glacier National Park area based on the information provided. Jordan Graham was part of the search team, but witnesses noticed that she seemed disinterested and emotionless throughout the process. As they drove around the park, Jordan made an unexpected stop at a secluded stretch of road leading to a mountain overlook known as The Loop. The area was hazardous, featuring a perilous 200-foot cliff overlooking a deep ravine filled with rocks. Despite the danger, Jordan boldly hopped over jagged rocks to approach the edge of the cliff, claiming she had a hunch about the location. Peering over, she suddenly yelled that she had found a body. The police arrived to confirm the chilling discovery. The body belonged to none other than Cody Johnson. The revelation sent shockwaves through everyone involved, and the investigation took a dark and disturbing turn. As more details emerged, it became clear that this was no ordinary disappearance, and the circumstances surrounding Cody's death were deeply worrying. On July 16, 2013, Investigators brought Jordan Graham in for another interview, driven by their suspicions surrounding her discovery of Cody Johnson's body at the Loop. The fact that she immediately led them to the location raised red flags, suggesting she might know more than she'd revealed. At the outset of the investigation, Jordan Graham provided a seemingly innocent account of her husband's disappearance. She told investigators that after having dinner with friends on the evening of July 7, 2013, They returned home and her husband received a phone call that made him visibly upset. 
Jordan claimed that she had to retrieve her phone charger from another location as her phone had died, so she drove off to get the charger. However, while she was on the road, Cody texted her, saying he was going for a drive with friends from out of town. But when she returned home, she said she saw him leaving in a dark car with Washington State license plates. That was the last she saw of him. Initially, the disappearance didn't raise suspicions of foul play. Given the rugged terrain of Glacier National Park, with its vast open areas, steep cliffs, and breathtaking views, it appeared plausible that an accident could have occurred. A person hiking near the cliffs or driving on the winding roads could have tragically fallen to their death. However, as the investigation unfolded, the inconsistencies emerged. The truth about Cody Johnson's fate slowly came to light, revealing a much darker and tragic reality behind his mysterious disappearance. Police rangers expressed concerns about Jordan's peculiar behavior during the body's discovery, leading authorities to believe she held crucial information. Jordan originally claimed that they didn't go to the park on the night that Cody died and that she found Cody's body near the loop because it was a place he wanted to see before he died. One of the things she said was that the Holy Spirit led her to know where he was, and that's how she found him. She said it was a place he wanted to see before he died. However, as the evidence mounted against her, Jordan eventually admitted to being with Cody on the cliff when investigators presented a security camera photo of the couple entering the park. Digging deeper into the mysterious email from the mysterious Tony, investigators traced its origin back to a computer at Jordan's parents' house. This finding only heightened their suspicions. Additionally, a friend of Jordan's came forward with unsettling text messages she'd received the night before Cody Johnson's disappearance. In one message, Jordan warned that something might happen. Faced with mounting evidence, Jordan Graham finally broke down and confessed to the unthinkable. She admitted to pushing Cody off the cliff. In her police interview, she tearfully revealed that she'd been unhappy after their wedding. Due to her strict religious upbringing, she was terrified of having an intimate relationship with Cody. I was feeling should have waited a little bit longer and then got married. But I wasn't feeling like it's on cloud night. According to the affidavit, Jordan disclosed that on the night of the murder, they hiked up to the loop where a heated argument began near the ravine. In the heat of the moment, Cody grabbed her arm, and in fear and frustration, Jordan pushed him away with both hands, causing him to stumble and tragically fall off the 200-foot cliff. Jordan Graham's admission of involvement in her husband's death, just eight days after their wedding, shocked the community and made headlines nationwide. The revelation brought to light the dark truth behind Cody Johnson's untimely demise, leaving everyone in disbelief and trying to comprehend the heartbreaking tragedy. In 2013, Jordan Graham, age 23, was charged with the murder of her husband, Cody Johnson, in Glacier National Park. Newlywed accused of killing her husband just eight days after the wedding by pushing him off a cliff. Jordan Lynn Graham has now been officially charged with murder and is expected to be arraigned in court later today. Federal prosecutors argue that Jordan had no grounds to appeal as she'd lied to officials to conceal her crime. In a dramatic turn of events, Jordan Graham pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in December. The surprise guilty plea left family members and friends of the couple shocked and devastated. When Jordan admitted her guilt, the victim's mother, who was in the courtroom, was overwhelmed with emotion, and other relatives and friends reacted with tears and whispers of disbelief. Despite her attorneys initially seeking a 10-year sentence in exchange for a change of plea, Jordan failed to withdraw her guilty plea, resulting in a high sentence. Her defense attorney, Michael Donahoe, had previously claimed her actions were extremely reckless but unintentional, and therefore she deserved a shorter sentence. Jordan's defense team alleged that Judge Malloy failed to consider that her guilty plea indicated a lack of premeditation in her husband's death. They also claimed that the judge made improper calculations when determining her sentence, but the details of these calculations remain sealed. During the plea process, Jordan Graham confessed to having second thoughts about her marriage. She and her husband went to the park to discuss it, where an unplanned incident occurred, showing recklessness with an extreme disregard for life. She later hid the truth and provided false statements to law enforcement, obstructing the investigation. Eventually, she admitted to pushing Cody from behind with both hands. Shockingly, as the trial was about to enter the sentencing period, Jordan filed a motion to withdraw her guilty plea, alleging prosecutorial bad faith and influencing the judge towards a harsher sentence. 
Prosecutors refuted this claim, asserting that Jordan was merely attempting to delay her sentencing. During the trial at U.S. District Court in Missoula, Cody's father-in-law, Stephen Rutledge, revealed that he'd spoken to Cody Johnson about going kayaking on the morning of July 7, 2013. However, Cody decided against it, as his wife, Jordan Graham, mentioned having a surprise for him. Eddie Alberto Colon, a friend of Cody, also testified that Cody cancelled a round of golf for the same reason, Jordan's surprise. Flathead County Deputy Coroner Richard Sign provided critical evidence, testifying that a black piece of cloth, possibly used to blindfold Cody, was found near his body, even closer than one of his shoes. A photo of the cloth was shown to the jurors. Cody suffered an 8-inch fracture on his forehead and was not wearing his wedding ring. Testimony from Cody's mother, Sherry Johnson, supported the belief held by friends and family that Cody was more deeply in love with Jordan than she was with him. She tearfully expressed her longing to be a grandmother, as Cody was excited about becoming a father. Cody's boss and friend, Cameron Fredrickson, gave his testimony, expressing doubts about the couple's marriage from the beginning. When Cody went missing, Fredrickson admitted that he broke into their house, convinced that Jordan had something to do with Cody's disappearance. Despite searching for incriminating evidence, Fredrickson found nothing. The revelation of Jordan's involvement in such a tragic event left most of her friends and acquaintances struggling to reconcile the person they knew with the action she admitted to in court. On the other hand, Lightune Blasdell, a friend of Jordan Graham, expressed disbelief at the idea that her friend could commit murder. Blasdell shared her shock, stating that she never expected Jordan to be capable of harming anyone, particularly someone like Cody Johnson, who adored and cherished her deeply. Blasdell emphasized that Cody would have willingly done anything for Jordan without hesitation. The trial provided a glimpse into the complexity of Cody and Jordan's relationship, leaving the jury with the challenging task of piecing together the truth behind the tragic events. It was revealed that Jordan's demeanor during the wedding period raised suspicions. Friends noticed that Jordan's demeanor seemed a bit unusual during the ceremony. To some, Cody appeared more invested in the relationship than Jordan. Witnessing her tears while walking down the aisle, some wondered if her heart was truly in the moment. Some stated that she seemed to have cried too much. Shortly after the wedding, friends received some unsettling texts from Jordan. In the texts, Jordan expressed doubts and second thoughts about her decision to marry Cody. She confided in her friends, questioning what she'd done and the path she'd chosen. Despite their concerns, many attributed these feelings to post-wedding blues, assuming that time would ease Jordan's nerves and the couple would find their way to a happy and normal life together. However, in the days that followed, a keen sense of unease began to settle over Jordan. Unknown to those around her, Jordan was grappling with a deep fear that had begun after their wedding day. According to a close source, she became increasingly anxious about the prospect of being intimate with her new husband. She said that it was just a miserable time, that she, they just really didn't enjoy it, and she just didn't seem very happy. She came over and she laid on the couch and she just cried. She wouldn't tell me why. She wouldn't say anything to me. The fear of intimacy weighed heavily on her, casting a shadow on the once happy couple and driving her to find a way out. In addition to the murder charges, Jordan Graham faced additional charges of making false statements. But the most worrying sign for observers and Cody's friends was that she wasn't worried about the death of her husband. They noted that she was busy on the phone during the funeral, which didn't only show a lack of respect, but a lack of love. She's the widow, and she's up front texting her little friend that she's sitting next to, and her mom and dad are in tears. While people were talking about him, and you know, like, the funeral service is going on, and she was on her phone. I was upset about Cody's funeral, but I was furious at her. I couldn't even think about anything else but what was going on with her. During the sentencing hearing, Jordan Graham tearfully took the stand and expressed her apologies to her family as well as Cody Johnson's loved ones. However, U.S. District Judge Donald Malloy revealed lingering doubts about Jordan's honesty and sincerity. He emphasized that he was waiting for her to show real remorse for killing Cody. According to the judge, as well as her assembled friends and family, Jordan maintained that she still loved Cody and claimed that the tragic incident was a moment of sheer shock and panic, offering no other explanation for her actions. 
Federal prosecutors painted a different picture, presenting Jordan as more calculated in her actions. They highlighted that she left the murder scene without checking on Cody's condition, indicating a lack of concern for his well-being. Additionally, the absence of drugs or alcohol in the case suggested that Jordan was fully aware and thinking clearly when she pushed Cody off the cliff. In March 2014, Jordan was sentenced after a judge rejected her request to withdraw the guilty plea she'd made as part of a deal with prosecutors. As part of the plea deal, the first-degree murder charge was also dropped. The decision followed emotional pleas from Cody's family members, some of whom requested a life sentence for Jordan. In October 2014, Jordan appealed her conviction, alleging prosecutorial misconduct. She claimed prosecutors publicly labeled her as a sociopath, distorted facts, and acted vindictively towards her. Nevertheless, prosecutors argued that her claims were based on unfounded assumptions and should not be grounds for overturning her conviction and sentence. The prosecution maintained that not only did Jordan kill her husband, but she also lied to investigators and attempted to cover up the crime with a fake email. The case of Jordan Graham is marked by a series of deceitful actions that have further complicated the tragic story of Cody Johnson's death. After a thorough and emotional trial, Jordan Graham was sentenced to 30 years and five months in prison for the murder of Cody Johnson. In addition to the prison term, she was ordered to pay $16,910 in restitution. Upon her eventual release, Jordan will be subject to five years of court supervision. In the federal system, there's no possibility of parole, which means she's likely to serve the entire duration of her sentence. This stern judgment reflects the gravity of her actions and the devastating impact they had on the victim's family and loved ones. The sentencing brings a measure of closure to this tragic case, but it also serves as a reminder of the profound consequences of one impulsive act. Everyone wants a safe place to fall, and you're mine. You help me to climb higher for a better view. You're my safe place to fall. You never let me go. When Shay composed these lyrics as part of Cody and Jordan's wedding song, nobody knew that Jordan would take it a bit too literally. Today's story shows a bride who, due to personal and religious reasons, hated the idea of the intimacy that comes with marriage. But instead of divorce or separation, she chose murder as a way to escape the union. Cody Johnson is a kind, loving, wonderful young man that I miss a lot. What do you think of Jordan's 30-year sentence? Is it adequate or should she have gotten a tougher sentence? On Thursday, October 18th, 2018, Heather Lynn Gardner, a mother of two, experienced every parent's worst nightmare. I did notice the hat over Benson's eyes. Um, I pulled it up, you know, I thought he was just sleeping. So I was like, oh my God, and I unzipped his snowsuit and I took it out, and I'm like, he's, like, hard, you know, like. It was just after 9 p.m. when Heather and her sister, Jessie Gardner, visited a laundromat in Wausau, Wisconsin. With them was Heather's toddler son, Jathan, and two-month-old baby son, Benson. Heather was sorting out the laundry as Jesse played with Jathan, and Benson slept in his car seat. When Jesse went to check on Benson, she discovered he was cold and stiff to the touch. Heather tried to resuscitate him as Jesse called 911. Officers from the Wausau Police Department, along with paramedics, arrived at the laundromat and immediately rushed Benson to the ambulance for emergency medical treatment. Unfortunately, it was too late, and Benson was declared deceased by paramedics on the scene. Officers immediately began investigating the incident. Was it a case of sudden infant death syndrome? Or was there a more sinister reason for Benson's unexplained death? Wausau is a city in the county seat of Marathon County, Wisconsin. It's the ginseng capital of the world and produces 95% of all ginseng exported from the United States. It's home to a population of 40,000 and is an outdoor enthusiast's playground. 
Residents particularly enjoy the splendor of winter in Wausau, as the snow transforms the city into a winter wonderland only rivaled by the North Pole. Like other cities of its size, Wausau has seen a steady increase in crime rates over the years. However, if one adheres to the basic safety rules of society, chances of becoming a victim of violent crimes are one in every 250 people, according to the Neighborhood Scout website. However, in 2018, Wausau became the center of a tragedy. On the afternoon of July 18, 2018, Heather Gardner dropped off her children, toddler son Jathan and baby boy Benson, with their babysitter, 28-year-old Marisa Tietzort. Heather had met Marissa through a mutual friend from work and decided to give her babysitting services a try. It was part of Heather's arrangement with Marissa to watch the boys if she had any errands to run or on the day she went to work. After spending the afternoon and a part of the evening doing chores with her sister Jessie, Heather called Marissa and told her to have the boys ready as she was coming to fetch them. Heather and Jessie left their clothes in the dryer at the laundromat and quickly picked up the boys. The two women went to the babysitter's house picked the boys up and returned to the laundromat. To Heather, everything seemed normal. Benson was asleep and strapped into his baby seat, while Jathan remained awake but drowsy. Both women returned to the laundromat and were seen on the CCTV footage sorting through their clothes. It was after a short while that Jessie checked on Benson and made a horrific discovery. His body was cold and stiff when she tried to lift him from the car seat. Heather then rushed over to Benson, unstrapped him from his car seat, and placed him flat on the countertop as Jesse called 911. The dispatcher talked Heather through the process of performing CPR on the infant. Soon after the call was made, Wausau police officers arrived at the laundromat, followed by paramedics who attempted to resuscitate Benson using life-saving equipment. However, it was too late, and Benson was pronounced deceased at the scene. Paramedics transported Benson's body to the Marathon County Medical Examiner's Office. Officers then turned to Heather and Jesse to ask them a few questions. Both women were clearly in shock, but were able to provide some details. They told officers that they'd just picked up Jathan and Benson from the babysitter, and only when they arrived at the laundromat did they realize something was wrong with Benson. Heather then told them the babysitter's name was Marissa Tietzort. Officers were able to get confirmation of Marissa's home address and rushed to the apartment to keep an eye on her movements. They weren't allowed to enter until they got the go-ahead from lead detective Jennifer Holtz. Meanwhile, Detective Holtz sat down to interview both Heather and Jesse at the laundromat. Before Detective Holt started the interview, Jesse told her she sent Marissa a message accusing her of killing baby Benson. Jesse apologized for acting hastily, but Holtz told her it was okay and considered it a normal response for what just happened. Holtz then asked Heather questions about her relationship with Marissa. Heather told the detective that she knew Marissa for some time and explained how they met through mutual friends. However, that night, Marissa seemed a bit different to them. Both Heather and Jesse told Detective Holtz that Marissa was behaving suspiciously. Both women felt as though Marissa may have abused substances that evening, which could have been the reason for her odd behavior. Heather explained that she normally went inside the house and helped Marissa get Benson ready. This time, Marissa didn't even let them pass the doorway and just handed both Jathan and Benson over. Marissa didn't even confirm the next day's babysitting times before closing the door on them. Detective Holtz knew it was time to talk to Marissa. Alongside Captain Ben Graham and several officers from the police department, Holtz made her way to Marissa's apartment. They knocked for several minutes, but when there was no answer, they entered the apartment by force. Police department, arrest warrant. What's up, police? Anybody in here? Kids room. Show me your hands, anybody? Marissa and her boyfriend Adam were nowhere to be found inside the apartment. Detective Holtz feared Marissa would try to escape after receiving the message from Jesse, but didn't give up hope. Instead, officers were able to get hold of Marissa's cell phone network provider and track down the couple to a local hotel called the Plaza. In the early hours of Friday morning, October 19, 2018, 
they knocked on the couple's hotel door. Adam, Marissa's boyfriend, answered the door. He was irritated with the police and accused them of harassment. Adam, it seemed, was under the impression the police were there to remind them about Marissa's upcoming court appearance. Morning, Adam. Good morning. Is Marissa here? What are you guys doing here? Lisa, Adam, just cooperate with us, okay? We'll explain everything in a second. Well, you already charged her. What the f***? Adam, stay here. No. You guys are harassing the hell out of us. If she already got charged, we'll be at court. Why you gotta come here? Well, because we need to talk to her about something new. Something new? Yep. Marissa, I need you to wake up. Detective Holtz then asked Adam why they'd booked into the hotel that night. He responded by telling the detective they were tired of the recent drama in their lives and just wanted a break from everything. This was not the detective's first time meeting Adam and Marissa. Marissa was a familiar face to Detective Holtz as she'd had a sort of history with the Wausau Police Department. Marissa Tietzort came from very sad beginnings. As a child, she was neglected and abused by her mother, who eventually used her as a pawn. When she was a teenager, Marissa's mother sold her to two men to make extra money. She then used this money to fund her own substance habits. The trauma of that experience forever scarred Marissa, who found herself turning to substance abuse to cope with depression. She eventually met Adam Borchardt, and together they had four children. For a while, things had become normal in Marissa's life, but before long, she was once again spiraling into substance abuse. This behavior was fueled by Adam's use of substances as well. Those close to Marissa and Adam started to notice that they were putting their needs above those of their children. Adam's father was the one who initially reported both Adam and Marissa to the Child Protective Services in Wisconsin about their habit in June 2010. After investigations were conducted, all four children were removed and allowed to live with Adam's father. Seeing that Marissa was losing control of her life, Adam decided it was time to intervene and persuaded Marissa to go to rehab. He too cleaned himself up after the shock of losing their children. After she returned from rehab in 2014, Marissa began babysitting as a way to make extra money. She helped out several friends with childcare until it came to people's attention that Marissa was being accused of hurting children under her supervision. The first incident occurred on June 7, 2017. The mother of the child had been a longtime friend of Marissa's. She'd left her three-year-old daughter and three-month-old son with Marissa whenever their normal babysitter was unavailable. The next day, the children's usual babysitter reported that the baby boy had bruises around his face. She told this to the children's mother, who explained that Marissa babysat for her and had occasionally dropped the baby's bottle on his face. The babysitter was uncomfortable with the explanation and reported her findings to the Everest Metro Police Department. The baby was then examined by a doctor who determined that he'd suffered other head injuries and a skull fracture. He was also able to determine that this happened within 48 hours of him being brought in for examination. Wausau police were tasked with investigating the incident and spoke to the children's mother. She repeated her story to the police just as Marissa had told her. The mother was cleared after taking a lie detector test to ensure she was not harming her children. On June 15, 2017, Wausau police interviewed Marissa and Adam, who said it was the first and only time they babysat the three-month-old and his sister. Their account of what happened was similar to what the children's mother had said. Police asked both Marissa and Adam to come to the police station to take a lie detector test. They agreed to set up a time, but never went through with it. Several attempts were made to reach Marissa and Adam from the police and the child's mother. There was never any response from the couple. Eventually, Marathon County Assistant District Attorney Chad Minder determined that charges could not be brought against the couple because of a lack of evidence. The case was dropped on October 18, 2017. On August 2, 2018, the parents of an 11-month-old girl took her to the hospital after she was hurt while in Marissa's care. When police were called to the hospital to speak to the parents, the baby's father said the abrasions on his daughter's face looked more like she was dragged across the floor. According to the child's mother, Marissa often watched the baby girl and her older sister together. It was the first time the baby was left alone in Marissa's care. Police gathered the information they needed and visited Marissa and Adam on August 7, 2018, along with social workers. Upon arrival, they discovered that Marissa and Adam had a fifth child, a three-month-old baby boy. When police and social workers first entered the home, Adam was calm and walked them through the house, explaining the incident. When Marissa eventually returned, she too told officers a similar version of events. 
They also noticed that Marissa was pregnant again for the sixth time. She told officers the baby girl was lying on the same couch as her own infant son at opposite ends. Marissa said she went into another room to clean up and do the dishes when she heard the baby girl crying. When she came into the room, she saw the baby lying face down on the floor. Marissa believed that the baby rolled over and fell face first into one of the toys on the floor. Police then asked if she'd ever been investigated before about allegations of child abuse. Marissa gave police an emphatic no, but they already knew about the incident from the previous year. They also knew the couple avoided them and the case was dropped due to insufficient evidence. When they stated that they were aware of the incident from June 2017, Marissa acknowledged the incident but maintained that she did not cause the injuries. They then told both Marissa and Adam that their son would have to be removed from the home and placed in the care of a family member until the investigation was over. Adam immediately flew into a rage, but Marissa remained calm. Marissa agreed to stay somewhere else, but eventually Adam called his father to pick up their son and keep him. The doctor's final report concluded that the baby girl's bruises were superficial, but more extensive than would be expected with a simple fall. On October 11th, 2018, the Marathon County District Attorney's Office charged Marissa with harming a child in her care. She was not taken into custody, but given a summons to appear in court on November 1st, 2018. However, before a scheduled court date, Marissa once again found herself being questioned for a far more serious crime. Officers interviewed Marissa and Adam separately about their version of events that evening. Detective Holtz and Captain Graham focused on Marissa and asked her what happened after Heather dropped off the kids. Marissa told them she took the boys outside for a short while before giving Benson his first feed for the afternoon. Marissa went on to tell Detective Holtz that Benson was asleep for most of the afternoon. She left him to play in the pack and play and switched on the baby monitor. She used the device to keep an eye on Benson while she was busy doing chores. Marissa then told the officers that Adam had come home around 6.30 p.m., and the two of them decided to take their son and Heather's two boys to McDonald's. She went on to explain that she put Benson in his snowsuit and cap and had him packed into his car seat since he was already asleep. She smiled inappropriately as she answered questions from the officers, even laughing at times. In fact, the entire time Marissa was being questioned by Holtz and Graham, she didn't seem to know why they were really there. It was then that Detective Holtz revealed to her that Benson died that evening. Why is he dead? We were hoping that you could shed some light on that. I don't know what it is. And I need, oh. and I need you to tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. Marissa's reaction was strange. She appeared zoned out as if she was trying to find the right reaction upon hearing of Benson's death. Detective Holtz first attempted to use an emotional angle to break Marissa and get her talking. Knowing Marissa and Heather had been friends, she hoped that guilt would break her resolve. Holtz repeatedly told her that Heather deserved to know what happened to Benson, but Marissa continued to deny knowing what happened. Both Holtz and Graham then changed their tack and began to empathize with Marissa. Detective Holtz hoped that in trying to understand Marissa, it would make her more comfortable and cooperative. Holtz pointed out that she understood Marissa's frustration and how sometimes people lose their tempers and make mistakes. Officers inside the hotel room continued speaking to Adam, who corroborated what Marissa told Holtz and Graham about their evening. The only difference is that Adam told officers that he was the one who picked Benson up from the pack and play and that Benson was whining before he put him into the car seat. Outside, Marissa explained why she and Adam decided to come to the hotel that same evening. Knowing that Marissa was evading questions, Detective Holtz called Marissa out and told her they knew she was lying. This is real reason, I'm serious. Nobody who lives in this town checks into a hotel at 9.50 p.m. after a baby died in their apartment. I don't know. I didn't know he died. And that's also a lie because she texted you and told you that he died. My phone's off. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. I'll show you my phone. I'm serious. How do you think we found you? After another round of harsh questioning, Holtz once again began to appear sympathetic towards Marissa. This is the third time we've had a discussion with you about a child, an infant in your care, and now one is dead. One is dead. Then who did? 
No one. He was fine. Did Adam do something to him? No, no one did anything to him. He was fine. Babies don't just die. She used a different tactic this time. Holtz attempted to ease Marissa into answering their questions by creating the scenario that an accident occurred while Marissa was watching Benson that Thursday afternoon. Babies don't just die. I would not kill a baby. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't mean to, Marissa. Sometimes I didn't. it's not what you, you do, Marissa. It's sometimes what you, you don't do. And maybe there was something you just didn't do tonight. And right. left him alone for too long. No, I didn't kill him. Was it an accident? I didn't see you. Did you leave him alone? I left him in the pack and play after we got off up. After we got back in from outside. Was he okay? He didn't make any noise. I have that video monitor thing. I didn't kill him. I promise you. I didn't He would never kill a baby. So what happened when you came back from outside? Check that. He just uses the video baby monitor. And, and he went back inside and checked. Huh? He went back inside. And he was in the back of what? Mm -hmm. What you saw was her. I use the baby monitor, and when he like makes a noise, it will. You can hear it. And I didn't hear anything, so. Yeah. I didn't kill him. At, at what point did you realize that he was dead? I don't know. Did he die in the back? This tactic worked, as by that time, Marissa had undergone a roller coaster of emotions with the questioning style of both Detective Holtz and Captain Graham. Marissa latched onto the subtle trap laid by the officers and started to explain how she found Benson that afternoon. So start, start over. It was like um, after when, um, before Adam got there, he checked on. Did you know that? But I didn't kill him. I know. I'll be true. Just because it has been that, well, he does sleep that long, and like, but I don't know, he like felt cold. And I was scared. I'm my sure. boyfriend wasn't I'm there sure. and everything, so I'm, oh my goodness. I'm, I'm sure, sure. I'm sure it's scary. How did you find him? How was he laying? I put him on his belly. And and how did you? How did you find him? How was, was like just just on his belly? Where was his face? Aren't like this. Face down. Mm -hmm. So if this is his face mm -hmm. and this is his back, and you put him like this, mm -hmm. and you didn't find his head turned anyway, it was just straight down? I think it was. Is there anything coming out of his mouth? Or no. Anything? He felt cold then, mm -hmm. and that was before Adam got home. Mm -hmm. Soon after, Marissa admitted to knowing that Benson was deceased and that Adam had no idea about it. Marissa claimed that Adam probably thought Benson was asleep. Did you put clothes on him? Did you put a snowsuit on him? I put a snowsuit and he had on. And Adam didn't notice that he was dead? He probably just thought he was sleeping. Did you check for a pulse? Did you see if he was breathing? Or did you feel his skin was cold? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just wasn't making any noise. What did you think was going to happen? How they came to pick him up? Uh, like, did you think she wasn't going to notice, or? Oh, yeah. Did you try to do anything to revive? Uh-uh. Try to do CPR? No, I don't know how to do that. Can you help me understand the uh, discovery there? Yeah, why, why didn't you call police? Because I was scared and my boyfriend wasn't there. And I didn't want my baby. I may be taken. Officers then informed Adam about what had happened to Benson. Adam immediately denied any knowledge of Benson's death. The officers then pushed Adam to answer truthfully about why they booked the hotel room the same night Benson was discovered dead. Adam told them that the plan was to meet with Marissa's sister Brittany and her children the next day. Officers knew that Marissa had finally confessed to being aware that Benson was dead before Heather had picked him up. Now, they needed to find out how much Adam really knew about the death of the baby. The conflicting statements about who placed Benson in his car seat needed to be cleared up. Officers again tried to scare Adam into admitting his part in Benson's death, but he didn't seem phased. Even when officers hinted that it may have been an accident, he didn't seem to grasp that they wanted a confession. 
officers assumed that it was possible Adam may not have known the full extent of the situation and was just trying to help Marissa out. They then told Adam that Marissa admitted to Benson being dead before he returned home that evening from hunting. His shock was obvious to officers. Even through his shock, he tried to defend Marissa. We want what's best for the kids. And okay? And I think you do too. I do. Yeah. And I even think Marissa does. Yeah. But she has a, a poor way of doing it, I guess. It's hard. I mean, you can ask anybody that we live around. Everybody gets in a mood where they don't want to be bothered or whatever. But normally when, she, when that happens, I mean, she'll tell me. And I'll take him, take care of him, and she can go to the shower and do what she's got to do. Every time this happens, I don't know. And that's why I told her. I didn't, I didn't want her watching any kids. Marissa was placed under arrest for the child abuse allegations from August 2018. She was then taken to her apartment to show Detective Holtz and Captain Graham how she found Benson in the pack and play. The officers needed to determine whether his death was accidental or not. After Marissa's demonstration, they were still unsure and knew they needed more evidence to get the truth out of her. On October 20th, 2018, Benson's autopsy results arrived. To the utter shock of the investigation team, they read that Benson suffered from several blunt force trauma blows to the head and a fractured tailbone. The medical examiner's report stated that the injuries were not consistent with an accidental dropper fall. Instead, it showed hard force being used on the baby. Marissa was taken in for another round of questioning, and this time, Detective Holtz and Captain Graham were determined to get a confession out of her. As the interview began, they told Marissa that they received the autopsy reports. What you're telling me is not true. Yeah, very severe injuries to his head. Yeah, I don't know how. I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain yourself. I promise you, I did not do nothing to him. Marissa continued to deny having any involvement in killing Benson. Captain Graham then brought up the possibility that Adam may have been involved, but Marissa denied his involvement in any part of Benson's death. Both Holtz and Graham then approached Marissa with an empathetic and understanding attitude. They explained to her their possible theories of what could have happened while remaining calm and non-judgmental. It may have been a fall, but something happened and it was not that he went to sleep when I stopped. It was not. So let's get over that. Great. Maybe I did not do anything to him. But what happened? I don't know. Something terrible happened and you were taking care of him. And it's important for Heather. It's important for you. Mm -hmm. And it's going to look better for you, quite frankly, if you mm. And this is your one opportunity. I am. If I could never do anything like that to any kid, that's why I don't want to think that it was intentional. If he was an accident. Of course, you have maybe more than I can imagine. A lot going on. You know, you have you know, this other case that was out there, which, you know, is a felony offense. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty serious. And, and you have other children that have been taken away. And, you know, you're on the road to recovering from some drug addiction. And sometimes the weights of life can become too much to bear. And you see yourself acting without even thinking, without even thinking. Just reacting in ways that are outside of your character. And I, I wonder if something like that happened on Thursday. Yeah. Because he's got some sores and just not receiving the feeding well and stuff like that. No, I would never, I can never, I mean, I love kids way too much, I can never, no. I hear you say that, and I, I want to believe you, like I said, but there has to be an explanation, and it's not what you told us. Both officers suggested to Marissa that Benson could have possibly fallen by accident. She then told them she could never have thrown him in the pack and play so hard. Detectives immediately picked up on her use of the word thrown. That was when Captain Graham decided to use the slip-up she provided to get the information out of Marissa. He began by asking how she held Benson before throwing him into the pack and play. Were you holding on to his midsection and putting him down? Uh, how did you? I put him in there, in the, mid, in the midsection. On his back or on his butt? I held him in... I'm going in there. 
uh, did you did you let him go? Like, was it like this, and then you just let him go with a, and so he kind of fell as well, or did you yeah, have hold of him so. and he went like this, or was it a? Yeah, I think so. It was like this. Yeah. Marissa then described to officers how she threw Benson. And then what else happened? And that was it. Uh, multiple injuries. Yeah, I promise you, I do not know where he got the under injuries. I promise. Did you grab him by a hand, by a foot? No. That's why I asked you, Marissa, how, how were you holding him when you threw him into the back of foot because he has some other injuries? Right. Like that he had some broken bones. David, I don't think he must do it that hard. Did he tumble a little bit when he was, when you threw him in the pack of plate? Like, did he roll? Because mm -hmm. I, I could see if, if you're walking down the hall when you come in the room, you're a little upset and frustrated, you throw him like that. I could see that he might tumble a little bit in the pack of plate and maybe yeah. get lodged up against. So I was just frustrated and threw him in the pack of plate. And what did you see happen when he landed in the pack of plate? Did he just oh, stay in one one position, or did he roll, or? I think he hit the side, but that's about it. What part of him hit the side? The head. After hours of repeated questioning, Marissa finally admitted to throwing Benson into the pack and play out of frustration. He was frustrated, and what shocked you was the fact that you threw him mm -hmm. into the pack and play mm -hmm. very hard. Maybe not with all of your strength, but you were really frustrated. Mm -hmm. And he tumbles into the corner, maybe hits his head on the corner, and then you stand there and he cries for a little bit. No, I just cried for a couple seconds. A couple seconds. And then in the middle. And then you take him from the corner, mm -hmm. he's no longer crying. Right. And you just set him face down mm -hmm. the center. Mm -hmm. I do move him if he wasn't crying. Marissa remained in custody on the initial charge of child abuse from the August 2018 incident. She appeared in court on October 22, 2018 for charges related to the case. Her bail was set at $250,000. She was held at the Marathon County Jail in Wausau, Wisconsin. On January 4, 2019, Marissa was charged with first-degree intentional homicide and her bond was raised to $500,000. The courtroom packed with family and friends of the baby that Marissa Tietzer is accused of killing, all wanting justice for Benson. We were able to issue charges today and um, start the process and uh, we were glad for the victim's family that we could move forward. Disturbing details coming out of court documents. A criminal complaint filed just today says the mom dropped off the baby at Tietzer around 4 p.m. on October 18th. However, when the mom picked up baby Benson hours later, documents say Tietzor knew the two-month-old boy was dead when she handed him over to his mom and even admitted putting a hat over the baby's eye so his mom wouldn't realize that her baby was dead when she picked him up. Tietzor is a mom of five herself and currently pregnant with her sixth. Documents say before baby Benson's mom picked him up, Tietzor placed the lifeless infant's body in a snowsuit and buckled him up in his car seat and drove to McDonald's with her son. She's already in jail on separate charges that she physically abused an eight-month-old back in August. Tietzor also requested her bond to be lowered, claiming she's not getting sufficient prenatal care in jail. On May 6, 2019, she pleaded not guilty to homicide and child abuse charges. She remained in custody and was denied a reduction of her bail. On September 21, 2021, Marathon County Circuit Judge Lamont Jacobson ruled that Marissa was competent to stand trial. On November 18, 2021, Marissa pleaded no contest to reckless homicide and child abuse. Judge Jacobson ordered a pre-sentence investigation be conducted and scheduled her sentencing for March 8, 2022. He also reduced the charge from first-degree intentional homicide to reckless homicide. On March 8, 2022, Marissa was finally sentenced by Judge Lamont Jacobson. Marissa was sentenced to 40 years in prison, 37 years for the death of Benson Xiong, and three for the previous child abuse charges. She was also given another 20 years of extended supervision after a 40-year sentence was complete. 
a former babysitter from Wausau will spend 40 years in prison for killing a child in her care and for abusing another infant. After over three years of waiting, families got justice in the courtroom. A judge sentenced Marissa Tietzort to 40 years in prison and 20 years of extended supervision. On October 18th, 2018, a two-month-old boy died while in Tietzort's care. This was after she had already been convicted of abusing a child in a separate previous incident. Investigators say she wrapped the infant in a snowsuit and put it in a car seat before returning the child to the mother's care. The judge reviewed various videos of surveillance and determined Tietzort knew the child was dead before returning to the mother. The judge said that he took into consideration Tietzort's prior history and traumas, but he couldn't consider he couldn't link the cases the judge says and I quote I think it's fair for them to describe you as a monster end quote before passing the sentence Marissa was given a chance to address the family affected by her actions in August and October of 2018 she apologized for what she'd done and said she should have told Heather what happened and not let her find out in the way she did judge Jacobson acknowledged that Marissa had a traumatic childhood but stated that nothing about her past excused her actions. What you've done to these two families is depraved, he said before sentencing. She was transferred to the Teichita Correctional Institute to serve out her sentence. She's expected to be released in the year 2058. Benson Yu Jim Zhang was born on July 31, 2018 to parents Heather Gardner and Jamie Zhang in Wausau, Wisconsin. He had an older brother named Jathan. His parents described him as a happy baby who loved to be held. He laughed whenever he was tickled under his chin and enjoyed going for rides in the car. His mother said he always had a ready smile for anyone and was an easy baby to love. For Heather, what hurt most was knowing he would never experience the milestones of growing up. He'd never take his first steps or speak his first words. For her, Marissa stole every precious moment she could have shared with Benson. Though Benson's death left a huge gap in their lives, it also helped put a monster behind bars and prevented other children from experiencing any form of abuse at the hands of Marisa Tietzort. Our case today is touched on a very scary subject, something that many of us don't like to talk about but needs to be discussed. Violence against the most vulnerable, our children, is the worst crime one can commit. So, as a channel that aims to highlight any violence against humanity, we ask you today to look out for the signs if you see anyone suffering at the hands of another. Speak up or seek assistance if you can. Our case certainly leaves food for thought today. Was Marissa simply a product of her environment, or could she have broken the cycle of abuse? If so, how? Let us know what you think in the comment section. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Your support, feedback, and encouragement are invaluable to us. And we look forward to bringing you more compelling stories in our future videos. Don't forget to share, like the video, and subscribe to our channel to stay connected with our content. If you have any case suggestions or topics you'd like us to cover in future videos, please let us know.